All right, we're going to get started here pretty quick. It's really good to see everybody this morning. Um, we'll get uh, get started our meeting here. Uh, first and foremost, I guess, uh, just a couple of quick notes with regards to exits. Uh, we have an exit over here to the left and an exit out the door to the right for emergency purposes. Uh, bathrooms are around back with the hallway there for folks that need to uh, go to the restroom. And uh, we'll recognize the traditional territories of the Comox people. Uh, next, I guess we're moving into item B, which is delegations. Thank you. Carried. So we have the Little River Enhancement Society. Henry Ellis and Rick Howell. <laughs> There's a little uh, button on the microphone there, a little gray button in front of you. And then I just got to let you in. Oh, you don't have to do that. There you go. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. As my name is Henry Ellis, I'm the treasurer for the Little River Enhancement Society. We have two of our directors here today. We have Lawrence Bay, our secretary, and Rick Hall, who's the director of community outreach and education. We're actually not here to make a pitch for any particular grant today. Uh, we're here as part of our outreach program. <laughs> The CVRD has been a, a great funder for, for our society for a while, but typically we've kept a very low profile and we've now decided that we should be out more in the community. So we're doing more community outreach and education. We have things like Facebook, we have a, a website, we participate in the, the river that never sleeps and lavender farms and things like that. So what we'd like to do today is just run you quickly through what our activities are, just so you can come up to speed in what we do and where your funds are being applied. So starting with a quick overview of the Little River watershed here, it's a huge watershed. I mean, it, most people hardly even know it exists, but it, it exits out by the ferry dock, headwaters up in uh, Beaver Meadows Farms, but then there's all these tributaries that, that flow into it. And we get salmon that come up as far up into the air base and then up into block 71 and all throughout. Uh, here's just some pictures of what the river looks like. Three uh, main focuses, we have incubation at our hatchery uh, where we raise coho salmon and, and chum salmon. We have an education component and we do restoration in the river works. There's a, just a little sign. Here's the actual hatchery. We have eight tanks, outside rearing tanks that we use for our coho and our chum. We have inside calf troughs, calf troughs, where we take the elven, once, once we've stripped the eggs out and they, they buy it up, then we put them in the calf troughs and outside. Typically, we carry about 16,000 coho fry and 100,000 chum fry. So it's a significant contributor to the system. Uh, in our hatchery, we have a, an agriculture license DFO, capture our own broodstock out of the Little River. We incubate the eggs, feed and monitor them for the 16,000. We do our own chum broodstock. Here's our egg take, where we strip the eggs out of the, of the fish, put them in a little pan, uh, mix them up with the, with the milk, and then they go into our our rearing trays there with the eye up. The, that bottom slide is, 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 was our project two years ago. We totally redid the system. We used to get quite a high fatality mortality rate on, on the eggs, sometimes as high as 20%. We've now got it down to about 2%. Uh, here's pictures of the uh, calf troughs where they come once they ride up. Uh, we released the chum in the early spring. The chum we released about two grams. They're very small. So as soon as as soon as they eye up and get out into the into the uh, tanks, we release them in the spring. They're all released down on Florence Road, which is just at the mouth of the uh, little river. 
and all our coal fire clipped. We clip 100% of them now. There was a time when we weren't clipping them very much, but now we do. The coal smolts are released in the late spring, 18 months after incubation. And again, they're released downstream uh, of where our traps are. Uh, this is a shot of the, the clipping operation where we clip the adipose in. These fish are really small. I mean, you hold them in your hand like this with your thumb and you got you need eyeglasses just to get your little clipper in there. And this is an interesting slide because most of these people are not our volunteers. I mean, our volunteers are all here, but we get volunteers from other hatcheries come. It's kind of a kind of a nice day. Then the, on, on the river itself, we have incoming fence traps and, and, and outgoing traps. The incoming fence uh, was a project we did two years ago. We upgraded that. And so what we do is we have a, we, we, we fence off the river and funnel them into a trap. And in the trap, they go past the camera. So we don't have to do any physical handling of our fish anymore for the incoming fish. And I had some stats here. Like back in the 1990s, we were getting like 61 fish a year coming up. In 2022, we had five, we had 639. So we really made a massive increase in the number of fish returning to our river as a result of our hatchery activities and our restoration activities. So we're actually very pleased with that. That's 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 been major. The incoming trap, sorry, that's the incoming trap. The outgoing trap is a little different. Uh, we have a different trap for that. And in fact, a bunch of the CVRD funds in this past year have gone to totally replacing our, our outgoing trap because our, the original trap got demolished last year in the floods. The debris came down, we just couldn't use it. So this year we put in a whole new trap on the, on the, on this, on the first bridge on the river, which is basically two aluminum wings that, that come into a V. There's a panel at the end with a six inch pipe. The fish get found in the fish six inch pipe. They go through a hose, they go into a trap. And then every day we go down and pick them out and count them. You know, that's another great success story. We're, we're counting in excess of 12,000 fish a year going out of that trap for the time we're doing it. And those are all wild salmon. Those are none of our hatchery fish because our hatchery smokes, we all really, really spoil the traps. So these are all native fish that are coming in and going spreading throughout these tributaries. And, and that's our count. I mean, we don't count them all. I mean, we put the trap in for a six week period. There's fish that go down before, there's fish that come in after. So, but it gives us an indication of how healthy the river system is. And that's what we're about. So this is a picture of the uh, incoming trap. See, we have a little gang plant plant out there and then the, the crates. There's the camera box. And we, we, we had to pay for a bunch of materials, but all the work in here is all volunteer labor. And, and then we get contributions from, we're actually quite good at sourcing contributions from the working community in the, in, in, in the valley here. We get gravel donated, we get lift services, you know, pick, pick, pick trucks coming and gravel, sand, uh, labor. <laughs> you know, people like Cumberland Sand and Gravel, latent contracting, they, they all give us up. Now, I don't know if I can make this one work. Lisa, you might be able to help me with this. This is a little video that shows, there's a button here where you can have it go through and you'll see the fish area. You see, here's a fish coming, there's a coal coming through the trap. So, so the way that works is they can record it on a computer and then we just, once and once a day, go down to the little, little shed we have, open up our computer and, and there's a spike when the fish tricks the camera so we can just hit it and count it without going near anything. 
this was a, the camera was actually donated to us by the DFO. And then, uh, just said, okay, can we, here's the next one. Can we, can we make this one move too? This is a chum salmon coming through. A little slower, <laughs> no hurry. We had a small problem with chum salmon this year, as you know, the chum salmon returns on the whole coast are really low. So we weren't able to get our chum uh, eggs from the Pundage hatchery that we usually get. So we did our own brood stock on chum this year. And next year we'll look more to doing that. This was the outgoing trap, but that's the one that got demolished and we haven't got any pictures of a new one. It just went in in April the 1st, our new one. So we're gonna to have to update this. These are just these are just pictures of the uh, fish that we get out of the, uh, the the outgoing trap, and one of them, and I can't see very well from here. Yeah, and if you if you look on the bottom right hand side, that's a cutthroat trout. So we do get cutthroat in this river. I think uh, there's a chance that Edwin may remember fishing for those with a stick and a string. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so far this year in our incoming trap, the, the, the majority of the fish come in in May, or sorry, outgoing, they go out in May. But we've already got, we put in April 1st, we've got 79 so far, including one cutthroat and a Pacific lamprey, the rest being whole. Okay, so education, school and community. There's a school program that, that, that Rick works with. We're supervised by the DFO and we, we provide eggs to the uh, airport school. There's a couple of their classes and they raise them up and then they take them out and put them in the stream. Uh, yeah, you can read that as well as I can read it. This is kind of interesting, actually. I was down on the bridge one, one day when the uh, mother came by with her daughter and her mother, oh, these, these traps are right by the bridge on, on, the, on the Little River Road. And we have a little board on it. And every day we put on how many fish come through. And the community walked by there all the time. You cannot go down there without seeing a community member walking by and asking questions. And this little girl was so proud. She said, "Mommy, I raised some of those fish in my in my class at school." That was that was really cute. Uh, community education. We have information posts up. We have Facebook alerts. We have data stations. Those what the fish claim. We get we get amazing uh, looks at our Facebook. I mean, we we put a little video on it, releasing some fish. We had five thousand hits on it. Uh, we have a booth at the festivals. I guess that's Lavender Farm, Rick. Yeah. Shamrock, Shamrock Farm, their Lavender Festival. Uh, yeah, restoration is really key for us. You know, we identify sites along the river where, where we need to restore them and improve the spawning grounds, remove the habitat. Uh, I think we've done about 15 restoration sites through time. I'm doing going on memory on that. But we this year we've we've got two separate restoration projects going on. One is to remove blockages in the stream where the which are stopping the fish from migrating upstream. And another one is restoring three of the spawning beds between Little River Road and Wilkinson Road. It's amazingly wild back there. You know, you, you drive down the ferry, you think it's all flat, just take a hike through the woods someday. You know, your flanders and meandering creek. And uh, actually, Dave Proctor is on wolves on his property, which I didn't know. And he's right on Eleanor Road there. And that's basically it. If anybody's got any questions, we're happy to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Ellis. Chuck Carver. <laughs> Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you so much to uh, the Society for coming to present and, and for personally 
for being able to put a face to an organization. I've seen that. I've seen the signs around the little river and been aware of your work. Um, it's, it's a cause close to my heart. I used to, for a decade, work for an organization, and um, our mission was to build a conservation economy. But where we where we work was where the salmon was or is, and that's uh, that was our geography from California all the way to Alaska. Oh, and the efforts like of organizations like yours are are giving hope to people that we might be able to reestablish some runs. And the numbers you're speaking of is really impressive. In the future, if you have any requests from us, um, whether it be um, for habitat protection, what exists along uh, your watershed, if there's issues that you feel the CVRD could help out with uh, in order to further enhance uh, the, the runs, then uh, absolutely come, come to our board and I'm sure we'll be happy to chat. Yeah, there actually is one really big issue that's coming up for us and we don't know quite how to deal with it, but the river is strong. You've seen the fish numbers, it's great. The problem is, is that that river has been artificially enhanced for the past 30 years, the water flow. And that's because the Beaver Meadows farms have been pumping 150 gallons a minute of water into that river during the drought periods. That may be coming to an end. Uh, the farm has changed operations and, and they, they think they can no longer continue to provide that water. And I mean, I was born here and I actually grew up on a farm on Knight Road. And what I didn't even know was that Little River ran dry in the summer times. Now, I don't have a better idea than that. And I talked to one of the, the Rickson daughters and she says, oh yeah, you know, in, in the summertime, you know, you, there was no water there. So we, we have a challenge and we're going to monitor it. We, and, uh, and if it does start running dry, we're going to have to find funds to keep that water flowing. There's a deep, there's a dedicated deep water well on the property, but that's out of the, some of the neighborhood is $68,000 a year for the electricity to run the pump. And that's what we need to find. Great to repeat. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you for bringing this uh, forward. Um, you are correct. Back in the 50s, I grew up right across the road from Beaver Meadow Farms. Yeah. And uh, I shouldn't say it, but we used to catch the fry and put them in big pickles jars with water and then let them go at the end of the day so you got the most. <laughs> Hopefully, it didn't cook in there, but. That brings me to, yeah, the the, the fact that it's being um, subsidized, um, uh, not subsidized, I guess, I guess it probably is being subsidized with, through the through the well and, and the electricity you're mentioning there. Yeah. So, um, and there is also some naturally occurring uh, springs, is there not, in this system as well? <laughs> and so my question, I guess, was around, um, first question, I got two questions, but first question, I guess, is, is around... Uh, um, the water temperatures and how you guys have fared in the last few years with all the extreme weather events. Okay, well, to answer the first question, first, yes, there are four springs that we draw water from. Uh, one of the projects we're going to be spending your money on this year is putting in a new line from spring one. We, we've got to put a six inch pipe in and clear up the thing because we've actually seen the water flows decreasing from there. Our header tanks aren't as full as they usually are. So part of the concern there is, is the springs, you know, come up from the aquifer, but there's that Crown Isle subdivision gone in right above us. Yeah. And we're starting to see some deterioration in our water quantities. I'm <laughs> sorry, but Kind of a chronic cough. That's Courtney water you're drinking, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's not not my well water. <laughs> Big difference. Uh, water temperature is incredible. We have a constant nine degree temperature, and that's the one reason that 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 our 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 hatchery does so well with so little mortalities is that, and the whole and the, and the whole river system for that matter. Because it is spring fed, where it's a combination of spring fed plus the artesian stuff from the well. But that water is nine degrees all year long. And so we don't have the problems that Rosewell and, and 
and some of these other places do where the creeks dry up in the summertime and the water gets overheated and they, they lose oxygen and everything else. So it's this river is a jewel. Uh, I just have one final comment, Mr. Ellis. Again, I'd like to personally uh, thank you uh, to you and your team at the Little River Enhancement uh, Facility for all the great work that you do uh, for fish in our community. It's really important work. And as Director Arbor had made mention of earlier, if there's anything that we can do to help out, we'll, we'll do our best. Uh, I am concerned uh, as you put forward uh, the issues revolving around water for the Little River uh, enhancement facility down the road. So um, hopefully uh, we can see some uh, great work or some uh, resolutions put forward that, that ensures that that facility uh, stays uh, in operation as best as they can moving forward. So uh, by all means, please reach out to us if there's something that we can do in, in regards to advocacy work uh, for your facility. Yeah, thank you, Richard. We appreciate that. I, I didn't also mention we do have a good relation working relationship with the Comox First Nations as well. And in, on both these projects I talked we were doing this year, we met with Corey Frank and discussed that with him and got letters of support and even an offer to pro provide the equipment to us free of charge to help with our, our, our work. Yeah, I did notice that you do have a deal for aquaculture license. So again, with regards to even the services that we work on with regards to or, or our mandate to uh, agriculture is one of those things that we are supposed to be uh, focusing our attention on uh, along with agriculture. So oh, good. Uh, so thanks again for your, your presentation and you. uh, your hard work. Yeah. Thank you for your time. We have a motion to uh, vote on receipt, sorry, for the presentation. Thanks. Sorry, all in favor on the vote. All right, next delegation, Brent Oyster River Hermitage Society. Thank you. All in favor. Good morning, and thank you very much for inviting us in on this miserable day. Holy smoke. Um, we all made it here alive. And I was just telling uh, Mark in the back that I saw someone on a bicycle when the hail was just blowing and pouring on them. Anyway, um, I, my name is Willa Cannon, and this is Arlene Bell, and we're executive members of the Brent. Oyster River Hermitage Society, and we would like to thank you for this opportunity to present some information about the hermitage on the Oyster River and um, some ideas we've been pondering on how to have a hermitage within a CVRD park. So um, this is the picture of the hermitage. Uh, which Father Charles Brandt built overlooking the Oyster River. He moved his original cabin from the Solemn River area where he was living with the uh, St. John the Baptist hermits um, to this property and then built around it. And he had help from various groups to build the whole place. So, um, the Brandt Hermitage Society, pardon me, going back again there, was founded with Father Charles, founded with him before he died to ensure the hermitage is cared for and used as a sanctuary for a person dedicated to the dedicated to the environment and a contemplative life. His will grants uh, the 28-acre property to the CVRD to establish a hermitage and a park. The natural biodiversity of the park is perfect, pro, um, excuse me, protected through a covenant which is managed by the Comox Valley Land Trust. 
And so we thought we should mention what Father Charles thought a hermitage was. So the word hermit comes from the ancient Greek word for desert, eremos. A hermit in ancient times moved out of wherever they were, their community, and into the desert for silence and solitude, which was conducive to prayer, spiritual growth, and union with God. For a contemplative person today, their dwelling and its entire landscape forms the spiritual ecology, which shapes their practice, growth, and communion. So we see spiritual ecology as being the place where we live, um, including our dwelling, the whole entire, pardon me, the whole entirety of the place. What does the hermitage offer others? A calm place to be in nature or on retreat, a venue for uh, people to join in conservation programs or spiritual ecology study, a walking sitting meditation group, which started 30 years ago with Father Charles Brent and continues today. It's on second Saturday of every month. Uh, over 2,500 books on spiritual traditions, nature, ecology, history, monastic studies, book binding, paper conservation. There's artworks, there's tapes, videos, slides. And uh, Father Charles also um, ran a book binding and paper conservation business to sustain himself on that property. So we're hoping as well that a resident could continue some kind of a compatible self-sustaining business. So that's the laneway into the hermitage. I don't know. Well, it goes through. Hmm. I don't know how long it is, but it's a nice, long, beautiful, lush walk. And the meditation group walks in there to the hermitage, stays for a while and walks back out in silence. By sacred, Father Charles means something that is held in the highest respect, something so precious that it must never be taken for granted, granted or squandered. There is uh, his library. Now parts of it are also downstairs and then there's some more parts of it that are quite messy still, so <laughs> no photo of those. So I here would just like to thank the CVRD who have given us a $23,000 grant to create an archive out of Father Charles documents and uh, photographs and all that and to create a uh, catalog his library and we're working diligently on that and um, that grant ends in the summer roughly and um, we have really enjoyed the project. It's a wonderful project. And we appreciate your help to do that. It's a, you know, not many people get to make archives anymore. So it's a very, very special project. Um, and so along with the books in his library, the items which are by Father Charles Brand in this archive are 20,000 photographs, two published books, talks on the great work of restoring the human spirit to nature, descriptions of his restoration archival material, um, his restoring of archival material, newspaper articles of his environmental campaigns and works, personal correspondence from his spiritual and life journey, and letters to government agencies and ministers on environmental matters. There's also interviews and videos featuring Father Charles. So that's Father Charles and a biologist, I can't remember his name, in the Solom River on the, doing the spawning salmon count. Some of his quotes, the universe is a community of subjects, not objects to be exploited. The planet Earth is a one-time endowment. The Earth is primary, humans and all other beings are derivative. So some of the ideas we've been pondering um, about how to do the kind of things that we would like to do as a hermitage society, stewardship, sanctuary, or special zone, 
Father Charles and the CVRD had discussed a protective boundary around the hermitage. We would like to work with the CVRD to ensure the property maintains its atmosphere of peace and quiet for the resident while also inviting the public to enjoy this natural sanctuary. We would like to be able to care for the, the land in a stewardship role, which would um, set the tone for conduct on the property, basically. And it could also go along with having a protective sanctuary around the building, around the hermitage residence. But stewardship to us would mean taking garbage off the land. People do throw their garbage on the land. Um, removing tree falls over the laneway, removing any invasive species, uh, you know, if there were areas that needed some enhancement or repair, that kind of thing. Um, so, a spe or a special zone boundary could be created to facilitate maintaining the building and our uh, programs within a CVRD parks regulations bylaws. So the hermitage is bounded on three sides by a steep 22 meter high riverbank. And the following diagram suggests a front boundary of roughly five, four to five acres and includes access to the power and water lines that come in off the end of Oaks Road. So here's the map and I, can't actually from here point out the property boundary, but the area that's brown is roughly five acres. And the property lines, you might be able to see them as sort of that big white space below the brown space, and then going over to your right. And yeah, not quite sure. It's hard to distinguish the lot features, but there are two lots, 28 acres. That parcel is about, that's in dark brown is in, uh, is about five acres. So you can imagine how much bigger the property is. See the steep uh, bank, the contoured bank, and then the hermitage is at the very end of the tip of that finger that's pointing out over the river. So the boundary, if there was a boundary created across the front of some sort, like not a physical boundary, but a technical boundary. The power lines would come in from the left off Oaks Road, along through the woods on the left. So can people see that okay? Ed, are you okay? Can you see that, Ed? See that okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll move on. Oh. <laughs> so a special zone might exempt the society from parks use permits so that we can um, continue offering the silent walking, sitting meditation, hold ecological and ecosystem courses, arts and study groups on the land, that would fall under a single insurance, a liability insurance policy. They would allow us access to the power and water lines cut across off Oaks Road for emergency repairs. And they would allow the resident contemplative to support themselves financially with a benign commercial activity in order to be self-sustaining at the hermitage, that kind of thing. Uh, maybe allow us to have uh, special events, gatherings at times, uh, celebrate the salmon return and things like that. Forest bathing was another suggestion. There's a bear that frequents his property, still around, and maybe a different one, but a very, very large, lovely bear. He used to walk through his little grassy area outside his, st his study. So the lifespan of the hermitage, Charles left the society around 10,000, uh, pardon me, $200,000 to maintain the hermitage. And the society plans to invest this gift and with community support, we hope to maintain the building well into the future. We believe the building can become a center for um, engaging the public in Charles's vision for humanity to live in harmony with nature. 
if some incident were to befall the Hermitage, the society hopes the CVRD will reconstruct a building that would offer a similar function to reflect Father Charles's vision. And um, his will expressed a conditional gift to the CVRD to establish a hermitage and park. And we hope that the CVRD could offer us a long-term reasonable, uh, pardon me, a long-term renewable agreement that celebrates the generosity of Father Charles' land and monetary gift. And in conclusion, um, we do want to thank you again for the opportunity to present our ideas, and we sincerely hope that you will support um, establishing a functioning hermitage within a park. Father Charles said we have to see the natural world, that it is there, and experience creation with a sense of wonder and delight rather than a commodity for our own personal benefit, to fall in love with the natural world and realize that the natural world is a sacred place. Thank you very much. Thank you, Willa. Is there any questions? So, oh, Director Reed. Thank you very much. Um, as you're probably aware, um, Father Brandt was obviously an icon in the community and uh, and when I first got elected, uh, we put together a, a forum called the Fisher Farmer Forestry Forum. We brought private forest companies, uh, uh, DFO, which everybody said you'd never get them to come to anything. They did. Provincial government, um, farmers. Uh, and, 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 and commercial fishermen because there, there still was a commercial fishery at that time. And I asked Father Brandt to come and say a few opening remarks, which of course he did in his splendid fashion. And it just took that whole vibration for lack of a better word and raised it like this. And that was one of the most amazing open discussions we ever had around, around rivers and resources and water in general. So I'm, I'm, I'm eternally grateful for, for Father Brandt for doing that. I think it was, it was fantastic. My question is around the, um, I understand there's a, a hermit in residence that actually, well, who gets to determine who the hermit in residence is? Yes, that's a good question. One of the programs we're thinking about is a is a we call contemplative in residence program where people might be able to do shorter stays and kind of experience that life. But right now, Father Charles chose the person who's living there. Her name's Karen Nickel. She's in her mid-60s and is absolutely wonderful. Um, she's been there. He, he, he chose her, you know, earlier on in his life. Well, I'd say maybe in his late 80s, he met her and chose her. And then he called her to come uh, just, before she, just before he died. And she came two days before. She dropped everything and came with one suitcase and has been here ever since. Yeah. So we would choose. So we would have some sort of a process where people would apply and we would screen and choose who came. Um, we have a website that we're just going to launch very soon. And uh, in there's, there'd be some information about how to apply there. Although there's no opening right now. <laughs> Not seeing any more questions. Thanks very much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Want to receive? All in favor? Carried. All right, next Delian. <laughs> Sean Cole. Uh, good morning, board members and 
public and staffing here this morning. Uh, thank you for hearing me again. I believe it's been almost a year since we brought this initially up. Approximately it was last summer. Um, we had some great challenges in the construction industry getting permits through um, the process that we had in place at that time. Uh, staffing came back with some great recommendations and we've tried to follow through on some of them. Um, the building department underneath uh, uh, John's guidance has been doing amazing work. The actual permitting when we're through into building has become streamlined and um, his acknowledgement of the contractors and for us to go in and ask questions and whatever the it's working very well. So I just thought I'd bring that along. Um, there was recommendations made at the time for uh, they were talking about a special area where contractors could put applications in. Uh, it was determined at the time that a lot of the processing time was dealt with because of homeowner applications, if we can recall that. That seemed to be a, a problem in the timeline. But I mean, that special contractors box never did come into tuition. Um, in actual fact, there's been two other things that have been added to the permitting processes, which have almost doubled our timelines now, which unfortunately that's probably why I'm here again today, although we've got some major great things that have happened, um, but we've also got a couple of very negative things that are going on with the permitting process now too. Um, the permit process now is under the, basically your permit is applied for, generally all online, but is not processed until it is deemed complete. Therein lies the issue. The completeness of a permit is entirely up to planning and the acceptance of that. That typically takes a minimum of one month before I receive any indication back from staffing whether my permit is complete or not. Although the Online, you can look that the building department is putting out permits in, I believe, eight to 10 weeks now, it, but only after completeness. So to give you an idea what was going on there, I've had a couple of permits in the last little while. One of them I now have, we're putting trusses on here next week. Um, that permit, after I applied and notified staffing, it was complete. It was about approximately 30 days before I received any information back from staff. And at that point, it was concluded that my application was complete and I did receive that permit. Although that was eight months ago, it was three months before I received the permit. But at that time, it was very busy and understandably, we had some staff shortages and we had some, um, there was some changes going on within the staffing in the CVRD, which are now been rectified and everything seems to be moving forward great in the building department. The second application is going on almost seven months now. Technically, I do not have a permit yet. I, well, not even do I not have a permit, sorry. My application has not been accepted yet. Um, it was held up due to what the CVRD didn't like in the planning department was a, um, I guess it be a floodplain analysis report from my geotechnical engineer. Um, I'll just run quickly through the timelines on this permit just to give you an idea of the difficulties that I've had going through with this permit. Understanding that this permit is an application on a waterfront lot. So, it includes a cultural heritage permit, which is done completed, and that was done almost a year ago. But it also included the flood protection uh, plane. It also included, there was a ditch on the side of the property, which we are in the process of still developing a DP for. Um, that's another issue in itself, but um, 
So almost a year ago, I came in and we I mapped the property to look at as I was hired by the um, Z custom built. That's generally all I do. Uh, we I mapped the property, looked at any environmental issues, any the process that I was going to be involved with. That's when I learned about the cultural heritage permit and other things that had to be involved in this particular process. So it was a year ago. It took me about five months to work through trust planning, new home warranty, cultural heritage permit, the flood protection plane, all of the prerequisites that I was going to need for this application. Then in October of last year, I applied for the permit and had an upload link and the permit was put in what I felt was complete by me. Um, that was reviewed and approximately a month later, November 21st, um, the floodplain construction report was accepted. Uh, CVRD uh, at that time told me a DP was going to be required because the geotechnical engineer's report, which stated I didn't need a DP because the ditch didn't meet the water course description. Anyway, they said that was not, and I would have to hire a biologist, which they had told me six months previous to that as well. So having said that, the DP is on me, understandable. Um, this is a high bank at Seabank. The ditch that's there is completely disconnected from the ocean and has been determined by numerous reports, non-fish bearing. So this is a ditch. It does not meet the definition of any water course in the CVRD's guidelines anywhere. Anyway, uh, November 23rd, the previously accepted floodplain report has now been rejected. Uh, the CVRD requested seven items on the report to be redone and clarified. Um, December 22nd, a new um, floodplain report was filed with the CVRD. Um, January 3rd, a new updated flood report. Oh, the, yeah, was filed with the CVRD. January 9th, the CVRD replied to the DP exemption. We, I hired, I don't know if I can use company names, I've hired an environmental company in the Comox Valley to completely oversee the development permit. So I would be hands free of it just because they know what they're doing when it comes to development permits. I've done several in the past before, but felt it timeline, it was better to have someone else look after the whole thing for me. So they had just completed an exemption on the uh, Seabank Road ditch a year and a half previous to that on another application for a permit. So they did an exemption letter again, feeling that because exemptions were existing on this, it's non-fish bearing, it's a ditch, it's very seasonal, only several months of the year there's actually any running water in it. It's only on one side of the road. The other side of the road does not have the same OCP regulations for whatever reason. It's only on the one side of the road. Anyway, um, we did receive a January 9th uh, reply to the DP exemption. Uh, they wanted more information from my uh, environmental company and clarifications of statements that were in the exemption. Um, basically, my understanding is, is that the CBRD wanted items added to the report um, and specifically things that they wanted. They were very um, specific on things. And looking back at it now, I believe those questions and things and back to my environmental to put on that report was so that they could then reject it. So when they clarified it, now they say, well, it doesn't meet this requirement or this requirement. So now the entire exemption letter was rejected. Um, Mr. Cole, we'll give you about two more minutes to, okay. to try and wrap up. Thanks. Okay. Um, January 19th, we were still under review. January 17th, the CVR rejects the biologist report. January 13th, the CVR rejects the new construction floodplain report. 
from my geotechnical firm. At that point, my geotech was asked to come into the CBRD and the premise for that was to just sign a copy of a letter stating that he received the CBRD's flood report that's on file here um, for whatever reason. February, um, they decided that they were sending the entire geotechnical review to the Geotechnical Review Board of BC. So they have on file a copy of the floodplain report for this area. It's on your CBRD mapping, the floodplain. They have it at 13.8 meters for whatever reason. That floodplain report would put the Courtney Library underwater. So just wrap your head around that. It's, you know, geodetic, it's 10 meters above property line, talking 30 feet. It makes, I don't know how that report was accepted and put on file. That mapping is still on your maps today. Um, anyway, that uh, CBRD rejected um, or sent that away to that. That took several months to go to, or a month or something to go to the, uh, and then, they came back and suggested that they wouldn't make a decision between two geotechnical, um, one my geotechnical and the one that was on file. They wanted a peer review done. Apparently, that's a standard practice with engineering firms. If you have two ideas that are so conflicting, you have a third. So at my cost, we did a peer review out of a geotechnical firm out of Victoria which was recommended by the Geotechnical Society of BC out of Vancouver. So that report was now done and that was now filed with the CVRD. Um, if we could wrap things up here pretty soon, Mr. Cole, that'd be okay. great. Thanks. Will do. Uh, February 16th, the DP application was submitted. Uh, March 14th, the after submission, the new floodplain construction level report went in. Uh, the peer review was then completed by the geotechnical firm out of Victoria. Uh, March 24th, the CVR accepted the peer review of the new floodplain report, which was within a foot of my geotechnical report from six months previous to that. So my permit was held up for five to six months because of information that was on file with the CVRD that was deemed now incorrect due to uh, a peer review of another geotech. So the mapping on CVRD's maps really needs to be looked at seriously. And how I've asked how much the floodplain report that was done how much did that cost us? This was a, it's a huge bulky report. Anyway, um, April 1st, uh, Mr. requesting Mr. update. Okay, I'm complete. So that basically we're, we're, a lot of these applications are taking, to be a completed report is, it, it's ominous that professionals in the Comox Valley, they're, their constant things are being looked at and scrutinized and and the timelines on these things are just are the two biggest things that have changed in the last year that has doubled our timelines is that this one month of waiting while planning goes through to accept our applications and then the second one just happened a month ago in that from now on all permit applications have to have all planning uh, sign off before they can go to the building department. In the past, they've always worked side by side. So if I need a development permit for a process and I need a building permit, obviously, they would both be continuous at the same time, both taking several months. Now I have to apply for my development permit, wait my two months or three months or four months or however long that is, and then I can now apply for my building permit. So that is realistically doubled the time that I am waiting for a permit. 
Anyway, thank you for putting forward a lot of concerns and issues there, Mr. Cole. And uh, what we'll do now is we'll open up for questions. Uh, Director Arbor? Oh, sorry, Director Green. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Sean. Uh, full disclosure, I dealt with Sean many, many times across the counter at the building supplies over my 30-year building supply um, career. Um, so as you probably know, you know, one of the main goals of, of, uh, of the CVRD is, is uh, to increase housing. So how are we doing so far? There, um, there's, been, there's been some great changes in CVRD in the last year. I know, I know, and, and you know, to be totally fair, um, it behooves staff to err on the, on the side of extreme caution, as they always say in legal terms, right? So we, we have to be very, very careful. I know that my, my cousin was a building inspector for years for the city of Courtney, and uh, they got in trouble over a church that was engineered in the roof leak. So who did they sue? They sued the city. And he's saying, this, this is one of the high, highest price architectural firms in all of BC that designed this thing. Why am I wearing it, right? So I do get it. And, and just, you know, for fun and giggles, uh, I'm waiting for a building permit too right now. So I'm waiting for a building permit um, for about a 600-foot addition to a shop. Do, do I map your property and what are your environmental concerns? Um, well, I, I, I've gone, I've been trying to do it by the book, like you say, and you know, I've, um, and, and you talk to these the, the professionals, you talk to the, the, the geotech and, and the architects and the, and the surveyors, and they share your view. So like they're saying, we appreciate the business, but I, I did the same thing down the road and uh, whatever. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to slag anybody in the, in the building department or, or planning because I, I do realize that, you know, that they're trying to dot, all the I's and cross the T's and all that. But, um, you know, when you've got uh, uh, the professional reliance model, which is what we work on now, so that the, the associations themselves are kind of self-policing. You talk about uh, the RP bios and, and, and the, the engineers, and they've all got their own associations. They're supposed to take a lot of alleviate a lot of the the stress. You know, your 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 on site septic guys uh, alleviate a lot of a lot of the responsibility and stress off off the bureaucrats. But um, my my feeling is that why doesn't I mean you've been building for forever, and a lot of people build pretty much the same house a lot of times. You know, just move the windows and doors around a little bit but they got to go through the whole gamut. So I just wonder, and I think we talked about this at, at Associated Vancouver Island Coast Community off, offline this last weekend, but why is it that, uh, that the uh, professional, why is there not a professional association for builders that would take a lot of this away so they could be more um, uh, self-policing, self-regulating like the other ones? Because, I mean, I, I understand that staff look at this like, you know, ka another day at the office. But for people that have sold their homes, have builders lined up, trying to, get, trying to you know, take their life savings in one lump sum and move it into a, a new, and then to spend a year going around in little circles, yeah. it's just not acceptable. And I'm wondering if you could tell me, um, they mentioned Campbell River, and I think it's at 500 square feet for an outbuilding or something, just need a siting permit? There's, there's I, some kind of a streamlined thing that they're doing up I there. Have, I have a firm rule about not going north of the Oyster River. <laughs> okay. okay. I, I've never, I haven't pulled permit in Campbell River in 15 years. Okay, but I, I know they have a little bit of a different thing. So, yeah. you know, I... I I don't know how we light a fire under this because it, it's... It's super huge, yeah, it, but you know, for, for people just going to work, it's just another day at the office. You know, well, my biggest concern, I'm at the end of my career. I, I'm not going to be doing this another five years now. I'm trying to maybe try and streamline a little bit of this for the next group of contractors coming in. But I mean, a month ago, I had to lay off two guys. Well, there you go. Exactly. And one of those guys has two kids under five. That hurt me. It just, 
shouldn't happen. And it's the younger people with the younger families oh, and all I, that. I, suffer because... I never built another house in my career. I don't care. Exactly. This is not about me. I mean, the shed, when it was built, it was Larry Shaver owned the property and he just poured a slab and got two by fours and framed something up. You know, I mean, that's the way it was. It's not falling down around my ears, yeah. you know. Yeah. And we do have areas still like on Texada and, and, and Powell River where there, there's no building permits at all. So, yeah. Correct me. So, um, is there a question? Well, I did, but he, but Sean said he had, he made a point of not building anything north of the oyster. I thought, I think there is some, some, a little bit of a different cant up there. If it's under a certain, certain uh, size, they don't have to go through as much rigor. I mean, building a home is a different thing, right? As a residence, so, that's a whole different question thing. Question, Director so. B. No, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks. Rick Garber? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I, I would definitely have a, a slightly different um, take on this issue from Director Grieve. I think that uh, what staff is implementing is the policies of the board, and it, it's up to us to define the policies. And we actually had a major opportunity last fall where apparently we hit some of it right, but we did not move. We, there were options out there to move to Langford model or third party, and this board, including yourself at the time, did decided not to do it. So I think to lay it on staff is a bit is a bit rich uh, when we are in charge of what policies we are deciding to pursue. And so I'm really happy to that you're back because it's not often that we get a delegation come back with feedback. And the first part of your feedback was great. It was great to hear that some of the things that we considered and implemented worked. I think when you talk about the floodplain mapping, um, we approved this last term as well, and I think it's a trend on the entire coast, you know, uh, and, and it's early days in floodplain uh, yeah. impact in the building. And, and I heard you when you talk about the 13 meters, that that does seem, you know, this there's probably a need. It might be nice for the staff to come back with a little bit of information on this, because another ag agenda item we have today is uh, around step code and, and how that's spanning out. So I, I realize there's a ton of pressure on Yes, there's a ton of pressure on the industry right now, and we want to get it right. I think staff and ourselves heard some of the comments you made around um, the two lines around development permit and building permit, and that's probably something that would be good to hear from them as well. So if, if there's tweaks or things that we can do to to, to better, but what I mostly appreciate is, is you coming back with both positive feedback and also some things that it looks like we need to continue to work on. So. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'd be curious on this. Staff wants to address some of these matters today. I don't know if the planning staff wants to address some of these matters that Mr. Cole uh, brought up or if they would prefer to bring back with a fuller report later on. Um, Mr. Chair, in response to the question, by all means, staff can report back to you on some of the claims. There was many there, I think, too much to respond to just verbally today. And uh, so if you direct us to, we can come back with the specifics that he's raised. And otherwise, we will meet with Mr. Cole with respect to the specific permit and just make sure that is on course and, and both Mr. Cole and our staff are, are moving that forward. Just one more quick. Thanks. Um, just quickly then, no, I, I, I want to clarify that, that I'm not throwing anybody under the bus. I realize fully that, that this is a complicated matter. But seeing as your, your eminent uh, retirement's coming up, perhaps it would be something to consider with the building association, whether or not that is a model that could be adopted by builders, much like all the other professionals up there, where they do have some of that, uh, what they call professional reliance model, where they could take a lot of that that pressure off by by uh, being self-regulating. So, just you know, in case you're wondering what to do this time next year, it might be something you can consider. Thank you. Uh, no further questions. Do we have a vote on receipt? All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Thanks again, Mr. Cole, for coming forward today and uh, your feedback on how things are going. Do we want to take a quick recess or move into uh, resolution status report? Yeah. Carry on. Okay. Okay. So, motion to receive uh, resolutions and status report. Sorry. Thanks. And staff are available if there's any questions of the items that are on the list.
Seeing no questions so far. Any questions for the resolutions? Oh, I'm happy to down less than two pages. All right. So uh seeing no questions, we'll vote on receipt the resolutions. All carried. All in favor? Carried. Excellent. Report. Savagery Planning Commission. Minutes. I move all minutes to the group. All right. We do vote or need no comments, questions? Okay, vote on receipt. All in favor? Carried. Moving to electoral area B, site specific exemption to floodplain management bylaw. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. I wish to introduce Stephanie Pollock, Planner 2, uh, new to our department. This is her first report to the ESC, so welcome, Stephanie. She'll lead you on the report, introduce the applicants, and answer any of your questions. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, through the CAO to the Chair and Committee members, an application for a site-specific exemption to the floodplain management bylaw has been received for the property at 2726 Comox Road. Existing development on the lot includes a single detached residential dwelling and accessory building. Proposed is a one-bedroom addition to the existing dwelling. Being within 100 meters of the sea, the applicant hired a professional engineer to prepare a geotechnical report relating to flood hazard per the floodplain management bylaw. The report indicates the year 2100 flood construction level is 5.7 meters. The floor elevation of the new addition will be the same elevation of the existing main floor of the house, which is 4.36 meters. The proposed house addition is less than 25% of the existing habitable floor area. Therefore, it is not required to be constructed at the year 2100 flood construction level, as per section 401 of the floodplain management bylaw. However, the floodplain setback determined to the year 2100 extends beyond the property itself, leaving the entire property within the floodplain setback and thus requiring an exemption from the bylaw as permitted through section 524 of the Local Government Act. The professional engineer includes mitigation measures to protect against flood risk, including building requirements, and concludes that the land is safe for its intended use, provided their recommendations are followed. Staff are recommending that the exemption be granted as the geotechnical report will be registered on the property's land title through a restrictive covenant. The covenant will also indemnify the regional district in the event of a flood and will include a condition that a post-development report be prepared to ensure that all mitigation measures have been implemented. I'm happy to answer any questions and I will note that the applicant and property owner Susan Garcia is in attendance today with builder John Gower on Zoom. Thank you. So uh, if, if the uh, proponents want to provide any comments or pull that I out. have no comment. My only, my only concern is that I applied for this to happen almost a year ago now, and I'm appalled at how slow um, the process is. That's all. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm in favor of the staff recommendation and, and to the applicant's comments. Hopefully you were tuned in for our last discussion. It's It's been going on for some time, not only at our local government, uh, but as we hear quite a, a lot across the coast. And, um, and I, I continue to hear from people um, that are finding the timeline still challenging. So uh, but in regards to the application itself, yeah, I I, uh, I concur with uh, with staff in regards to the next steps and the recommendation. Thank you. Director Brief, any comments? No. Fair enough. So, uh, not seeing any more questions. A vote on receipt. Move recommendation. Second. All in favor and carry.
All right, moving on to the sewer extensive self liquid waste management plan. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Just let the Gowers know that the resolution was was passed, accepted. All right. Sewer extension itself. Thank you. Thank you, Chair and Directors. Vince Van Pongren is here and with uh, the support of Derry Monteith to present this report and answer any of your questions. Yeah, thank you, Russell. Um, through the Chair and the CAO, uh, the purpose of this report is to present an update on the current status of the sewer extension south LWMP addendum in advance of a subsequent report at the next meeting where recommendations will be provided for your consideration. Joining us on the line for this presentation is our committee chair for the addendum public and technical advisory committees, Andrew Gower. I feel like my volume's too long. Okay. And for the record, no relation to John Gower. Okay, there, there's a there's a long history of wastewater planning in electoral area A uh, with studies of options for Royston and Union Bay going back several decades. Out of this, the extension of sewer services south is understood to be the optimal wastewater management option for the area. Uh, the Sewage Commission supports the future acceptance of wastewater flows from the south. Uh, consideration for this is included in the CVSS LWMP currently underway, and the CVSS service area boundary has been extended to portions of Area A uh, anticipated to be serviced by the Sewer Extension South project. All of this has uh, paved the way for consideration of this project through a liquid waste management plan addendum. Uh, this was approved by the ESC and Sewage Commission in June of last year. Uh, the figure on the slide here shows how the addendum process fits into the overall process for the CVSS liquid waste management plan. There's been considerable progress since then, including additional technical work, a value engineering workshop, the formation of public and technical advisory committees and four meetings that have covered a broad range of materials. Uh, out of those meetings, the public and technical advisory committee has reached consensus on several motions for the steering committee's consideration. And last but not least, uh, last Friday's announcements for, from the province for funding for this project out of the critical community infrastructure funding was certainly uh, great news for the project. The project is anticipated to unfold over several phases, starting with phase 1A. Uh, this would establish conveyance infrastructure from Union Bay into Courtney and develop local collection systems in the core area of Union Bay and a portion of Royston. Phase 1B is anticipated to follow, and this would expand the collection network in Royston and construct a new pump station and collection system in the Kilmarnock neighborhood. Uh, both phases 1A and B do include some initial conveyance capacity for development that's anticipated in the area. Uh, future phases will see collection systems and pump stations for other neighborhoods and expand the capacity of the conveyance portion of the system as needed for future development. The next slide here shows um, project costs. Uh, the table at the top is overall project costs. Uh, these costs show include conveyance costs that have been developed to a class C level, collection system costs at a class D level, and these uh, these numbers also include contingency, engineering, and cost escalation to the, to 2025. Uh, how this translates into per property cost estimates, uh, taking into account grant funding and potential partner contributions. Uh, that's the table at the bottom of the slide. And um, additional to the figures in the table, there will also be operating costs at about $600 per year for each property that's connected to the system. 
In terms of next steps, um, we're currently investigating val value alternatives that were identified through the value planning workshop. Uh, uh, WSP is taking a closer look at the force main alignment options that were identified in that, and also taking a look at options for the waste and pump station location. And we anticipate having more information on this in at the May meeting. And an additional report at the May meeting will include uh, recommendations for, for this committee's consideration, including endorsement of the motions put forward by the, by the PAC-TAC, and also looking at consideration of a deferral program for properties that have installed new septic systems, and potential consideration of project funding for some private property works. I will also be looking for this committee's support for upcoming consultation and to move forward with preparing the draft addendum report. And this last slide shows um, where we're at in the process, the green arrow, or where we're gonna be at in May with the, with the green arrow there and where the uh, addendum report will kind of flow through the various uh, committees uh, prior to being submitted to the to the province um, at some point next year. And with that, happy to answer any questions. Great, Trevor. Thank you, Chair, and what excellent timing to have this presentation following uh, Friday's announcement. And I, I will begin by, um, because not everybody was there on Friday, I will begin by celebrating really this historical investment uh, at this time from the province of BC. Um, I really wanted to thank the, the staff team for doing all the work towards this. Um, Russell Dyson, Mark Rutten, Vince and Derry. Um, it's been a hard journey and I just joined it four years ago. <laughs> and some of you have been on this journey for about 15 years, so it's pretty amazing. Um, I also want to acknowledge that uh, Doug Gillian, the chair of the Switch Commission, is here with us, and the Switch Commission had, had a huge role to play in this. And I also would like to give a special acknowledgement to Richard Hardy, who in a spiral role at Comox First Nation. I don't think that this project exists without his contribution as part of KFN uh, in the partnership towards uh, pursuing the grant and also uh, creating a framework that I think is successful. I'll slowly move on to my question, uh, but I, I also want to acknowledge there's a lot of people putting a, a lot of effort on the pack tack right now, and we have the facilitator in the room, and we have Andrew Gower in the line on the chair, and I've been following some of the meetings online because I have been away for a couple of them, but obviously a lot of work that's going on and a lot of healthy debate at that table around some of the options um, and trying to arrive at consensus on the items. So it's it, the timing is great for the grant. I'm hoping it's going to energize the table and make people feel like you know we're heading in a direction that is not just theoretical, but now is quite in the domain of the prob probable. Um, I have a question about um, some of the, some of the stuff I heard, and again, I I was not at the meeting, so it's just, it's just a, maybe secondhand, but. There was some some discussion, I think, around uh, whether the addendum would include septic regulation outside of the zone area. Is that something that is still happening, or has that been parked by the table for the boundaries and areas outside of the project? Yeah, I think because um, the plan area is is, is fairly defined, um, as, as shown in the the CVSS uh, service area boundary. So the plan is kind of defined by those portions of, of area A that are that are within the CVSS service area. So while there was discussion on the potential application of, of septic regulations at, at a broader scale, I, th I think at, at the end of that discussion, the, the committees did recognize that, um, that their role is to look at how that could potentially play out in the areas um, within the sewer extension south. Um, project boundary. Oh, okay, thanks. Uh, maybe a further just to clarify my thoughts, if I may, Chair. Oh, and we have a come. Mr. Chair, if I could just add sure. to you that uh, we will be reporting out to the EASC okay. community shortly on septic regulations as a broader electoral area potential service. We'll, we'll be giving you more input on that shortly. Great, Great. thank you. My, my question, perhaps I, I did not phrase it properly, because within the area that we are, some households may not be connected for a very long time. So that that's where. Um, 
my question was was guided. It's okay if you say there's a report coming, I, I will gladly wait for it. Um, but for today, to be honest, I don't have a lot of questions. I think the process is going well. I, I, I'm aware of uh, of some of the substance of the discussions, and and uh, and I definitely plan to attend the next meeting, assuming I'm in the Comex Island. Thanks, Mr. Gower. Uh, yeah, the only thing I wanted to add on the issue of the regulation is I think there was pretty strong consensus from the PACTAC that the regional district should have an on-site wastewater regulation of some kind. Um, that's just the one point I wanted to add on that subject. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Haley. Thank you, Chair. I just want to uh, thank uh, the uh, committee for having me here today and uh, uh, just offer my full support for this uh, process. Uh, as Chair of the Sewage Commission, I also want to acknowledge uh, being at the funding announcement on Friday and uh, I regret, uh, Chair Hardy, that uh, you were not able to be there. I, I think that was an omission, uh, which I've uh, discussed with, uh, with staff and uh, uh, I want to join Director Arbor in acknowledging uh, the work that you did on on this project and uh, how important I know it is to the uh, Comox First Nation. And uh, just want to offer my full commitment to uh, moving forward with this uh, process in a uh, productive and an inclusive way. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Director Green. Just briefly, um, I think a uh, shout out to uh, everybody who's been working on this for so long. Uh, I think this is the fifth iteration of a, a sewer for the area. So, you know, fifth time lucky. Director Robert. Yeah, thanks, you. And that just prompted me. Um, you know, following the announcement, there's already a lot of questions in the community. And for those of for those tuning in to um, to this discussion in the community in Union Bay and Royston, there are a number of planned open houses uh, and, and community engagement sessions coming through this summer and, and spring. I know some people said, oh, I'll read the question about, is there a referendum? And all these things are popping up on Facebook. And I can assure the community that we'll be coming up with uh, a lot of information around the nature of the process, where we're at with it, and some of the options that will be considered. Thank you. So before we do a vote, uh, again, just a reminder that we have Director Hill here as the Chair of the Sewage Commission, and uh, he has the ability to participate and vote on the receipt of the report. So do we have a uh, vote on receipt? All in favor? All carried. Thanks. I sure agree. This is Jennifer. Sure. What do you want to do? Eight minutes? Seven. What is it? We'll come back at 1130. Thanks.
All right, uh, call the meeting back to order here. We have a motion to uh, receive the BC Energy Step Code Implementation. Thank you. Thank you, chairs and directors, chair and directors. John Crockford is here to uh, present this report and uh, respond to any of your questions. Uh, good morning to the chair, to the directors. Um, I'm presenting a, presenting on the BC building code changes coming May 1st, step code and proposed changes to the planning and building application fee rebate policy P62. The province has approved two changes to the BC building code to be adopted May 1st, 2023. They provide framework to limit the energy consumption and carbon emissions from new homes. The first change will effectively make new buildings 20% more energy efficient throughout BC. They're proposing to do this by having small build buildings meet what is currently step three of the BC Energy Step Code. They're introducing carbon output step levels similar to the Energy Step Code, where new buildings could measure their carbon output without reductions or meet medium, low, or zero carbon ready requirements. Heating, cooling, and hot water equipment make up most of buildings' greenhouse gas emissions, so choosing the right energy source for those uses will be key to reducing emissions. Just like the energy step code, the minimum standard will, ri will rise gradually until all new buildings are zero carbon. The building sa and safety standards branch will be releasing more information in the coming months to support local governments and a smooth rollout of the change. These updates to the BC building code will support a transition to net, net zero buildings by 2032 reduce the amount of energy required by new buildings and offer an efficient set of standards for, for building of energy performance. Okay. The PC Energy Step Code offers a simple and efficient set of standards for building energy performance. It aligns nicely with many of the existing energy performance programs that builders are already familiar with. It will also help the CVRD achieve our climate action goals by reducing GHGs that are generated by the residential building sector. It's a performance standard that is designed to drive steady increases in energy, efficient, energy efficiency in new construction. It's not a standalone code, but rather embedded within the BC Building Code. In, in 2018, the province released its Clean BC strategy, which reaffirmed the net zero energy ready target and established new interim deadlines. The first deadline is May 1st, when new homes must perform 20% better. There's a subsequent deadline in 2027. To achieve the lower steps, building and design professionals and trades can rely on conventional building designs with careful air sealing practices and incorporate some key elements in the design, building envelope and equipment systems. Builders and designers are advised to collaborate with their energy advisor to select the most cost-effective way to meet the requirements. The BC Energy Step Code requires home builders to work with an energy advisor who recommends more efficient solutions, reviews construction progress, provide mid-construction and final testing, as well as assist with applying for any rebates available. The six strategies that cost effectively boost performance are to boost your insulation, add insulation, you ventilate smartly, so bring plenty of, plenty of fresh air into the home and recover heat from the exhaust air leaving the building. Mind your machines, so choose efficient appliances and ensure your heating system will meet but not exceed the home needs. So this one, like your, your energy advisor, when they model the house, they take the square footage and they take the volume and they ensure that your energy or your heating system is designed specifically for your house. Because you could have an extremely efficient heat pump or heat pump system, but if it's oversized for your house, it is going to cost you more money 
than a cheaper solution here. Um, the other one is minimize thermal bridging. A break in your insulation acts like a bridge that carries heat straight out of the house. So you'll see now lots, lots of houses are using exterior insulation on the house, whether it's mineral wool or, or styrofoam. Um, seal it up, so air leaks and heat leaks. You wrap the home tightly now, taking care to seal around ducts, pipes, fixtures from wires that pass through walls, ceilings, and roofs. And you really have to think about doors and windows now. You have to carefully consider the energy performance, the size and locations. Um, studies commissioned by the province and affordability of the step code estimate that the program would add between one and 3% to total construction costs. All right, go to the next slide. So I'm just pulling up a slide of a Campbell River four bedroom home that reaches step three. It was 0% um, above 0% more to build to the step. Um, they used everyday materials and a strict attention to detail. The, the two of the strategies they used is they sealed it up. They, they spent a whole bunch of time sealing all their building envelope, the Tyvek or Typar to the, every penetration was sealed with tape and, and the details were, they just spent more attention to detail. They didn't change anything or do anything different than regular construction practices. There's the house there. Um, so they use an air source heat pump that keeps the home cozy through the chilly and damp northern Vancouver, northern Vancouver Island winters. A tankless on-demand natural gas water heater, um, which also allowed the contractor to access a utility incentive. Um, so, so they built this house without doing, without any added cost, and were able to meet step three. And this was this was done in 2018. Um, so buildings built to higher energy efficient standards provide multiple benefits to those who live, work, and learn within them. So they improve temperature by or improve comfort by better managing temperature. They improve health by better managing fresh air. They reduce noise, better insulation and air tightness. They require less energy, helping occupants lower their energy bills, and they're more durable. They play a key role in reducing GHG emissions and helping reach our climate targets. The BC Energy Step Code changes will support, support the climate change objectives of the regional growth strategy in respect to reducing greenhouse gas emissions from the building sector. There's no specific cost to the CVRD to implement these building code changes. However, cost benefits to the public help achieve CVRD achieve their climate action goals. The cost of implementing step code for new construction will vary depending on which step is applied. To reflect the BC building code changes being implemented on May 1st, staff are proposing that the existing current planning and building application fee be rebates policy be revised prior to May 1st. Since 2017, the regional district has offered building permit fee rebates up to 100% when new homes meet step three and above. On average, rebate recipients receive, have received $1,000 on fees of approximately $4,000. These fees come out of building permit revenue. A step three will be required across the province for permits received on or after May 1st. Under the current CVRD policy, all applicants will be eligible for a rebate and the rebates will cease to be an incentive to exceed the minimum standard of energy efficiency. To continue with the policy as is, as new home construction permit fees would be entirely covered by electoral area tax requisition. To continue the rebate program now that step three will be mandatory is not sustainable for the service. Um, currently, none of the member municipalities provide rebates for step, step code compliance. Staff will continue to explore options available for further rebates and incentives on new construction in the electoral areas and will report back with available options. For example, rebates that will incentivize carbon pollution standards, which will reduce the GHG emissions from new buildings. The City of Courtney and Town of Comox were early adopters of mandatory step code, and we'll, we will be communicating with all member municipalities to try and collaborate on education and implementation, including options for the phasing in of the carbon pollution standards. Um, Jim Zeros is here today, who's a board member for Canadian Home Builders Association. 
and a local builder is an active participant in ongoing construction education. Um, he's actually the first company to complete a net zero home in North Vancouver Island and has lots of experience building to the various steps of the step code. Um, so we're here for questions. Hey. Thanks, Jim. Director Garber. Thanks, Chair. And um, I'm struggling with my package this week because we get in on Friday and we had AVICC this weekend. So I opened my package at 7 p.m. And I'm waking up today at with 92 million in the capital projects in area in the next four years. Um, so this report I did not read fully. So I apologies if the questions I will ask are already in the report. Um, one is, um, uh, is is there a thought that maybe we should keep the rebates for step four and step five? I think it, it's not a large amount. Obviously, I agree with dropping step three since um, where uh, everybody is going to be required to do it. But I see to 27 and 32 that there's an opportunity maybe to phase out those rebates to those who go above standard. It's almost symbolic, in my opinion. I'm looking for step three. We only had 14 homes. First question. Second question, um, does, uh, I got asked that by a resident uh, last summer, is the step code will apply to major renovations as well, or it's purely for new construction? Thank you, that's my, that's my two questions for today. Um, I'll answer the second part, just it's fresh in my head. Um, it, so for, for the renovations, it would almost be like a case by case, sort of basis and the province is going to be providing details on that because that's one of been that's been the one of the major questions from all municipalities is how on earth are you requesting people to meet the air changes or the the blower door testing on existing homes that they just want to you know use the use the structure and uh stay within it or do an addition so there will be there will be exceptions and they won't have to meet the same um, air changes and things like that, but they would still have to meet the requirements for energy efficiency, insulation, those kind of things. Um, and then the first question about incentivizing step four and five, who's that? Yeah, basically, I'm, I'm, and maybe it's a suggestion actually that we could enact that this uh, this table. But I, I would be in favor if it's not already in the plans to maintain the rebates for homeowners who pursue step four and step five, not step three. Yeah, is that I, in the report? Sorry if I. Um, it's not, but we, you know, I guess I would answer it to say it would have to be edited because, you know, step four. We would be rebidding seven, like how it is right now. We'd be rebidding seventy-five percent of permit fees for every every permit. Step five would be a hundred percent, right? Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Atlanta, but, if if it's easier, and if I, and then I can go ahead. But I could also just ask for a report back at next meeting on the implications. But go ahead. Okay, go ahead then. Uh, through Mr. Chair to the directors, I'm I'm saying that partially in jest, just because um where we are right now with workload as you as you well know but but i think to john's point our our interest absolutely is in collaboration and finding what are the incentives that would make the most sense um john and the team have really looked into the carbon pollution standard and incentivizing that because that is potentially optional so when we come back with that discussion uh what we can speak to are the budget implications for providing roommate rebates to step four and five those would be substantial over the steps three because of the relationship between construction value and permit value and therefore rebate. Um, so, so yeah, we will be coming back to you uh, within the next few months. And we also think there's some opportunities, as John mentioned, to work with the municipalities on um, you know trying to, to collectively incentivize those carbon pollution standard rebates. Dr. Pete, did you have a question? Thanks very much. Um, my question is around our municipal partners and where are they on this timeline? Um, so 
So the town of Comox and city of Courtney, uh, step three has been mandatory since January 1st, 2021, um, I believe. Uh, we were the only, we offered the, the rebates, but they, they had step three mandatory for since 2021. Um, I, you know, I've talked to them and I think they're working on updates to require to make step four mandatory. I, I don't have specific dates. Thanks, Jim. Did you have any other comments or thoughts? I got lots of thoughts. Uh, moving ahead from three to four to five gets really expensive. And the concern I throw to the regional district, and we've learned this over the last five years, is what's more important, energy reduction or the carbon footprint? because people can build a step five house at a higher carbon footprint than they were doing 20 years ago. So don't get confused when you're trying to go green and build that there's two pathways. And Victoria, I know has adopted uh, that now the carbon footprint is a big deal, a part of the permit. So sourcing material is another issue. And I know for us, we've done some projects uh, that were completely no VOCs and it's really challenging to keep that cost and price down because we had some health issues with one family and just to do the kitchen alone to go with the no VOCs in, in the wood and the, the glues was about 9,400 bucks just in the kitchen material. But the good news on it is that as we've been doing this, the cost of the stuff is coming down. So the more areas and, and municipalities take this stuff on, the better we'll be able to shop. Because now when I started, my first solar panel that I got when we did up in Lake Trail was from back east. Now I think there's three or four solar manufacturers that you can deal here locally on, on the island. And the price has come down on that. And now we're using bifacial solar gain from the back of the panels where three years ago that didn't exist. So it's just, trying to adopt to uh, fit this stuff in is the direction on what areas like how they want to lead in this new energy and car carbon footprint so yeah I'm, I'm so glad for those comments because i think that they speak to kind of the the bigger picture um i, I moved from a 900 square foot home to a, a big increase to 950 square foot home and in today's world, I'm pretty sure that that's not the kind of home. So, you know, when you talk about the efficiency of a home versus its overall carbon footprint, there's something to be looked at. Uh, in rural idea areas, will probably be exempted, I, I imagine. But I know the uh, the province is looking at that very topic and maybe starting to phase out the, the single residential homes altogether in favor of, of other multi-story and the rest of that. I know that they're on the path to to look at the overall picture in municipalities and elsewhere, we're hearing those debates from Premier Hibby and, and otherwise. So I, I agree with you, um, it's probably a little bit beyond the scope, but I think when we make those decisions um, like this one, and and uh, unfortunately I didn't read the full report, so I can't speak as a, the, I'll have to read about the carbon pollution uh, that you're gonna be working on, because that's something I haven't really looked at yet. But I, I welcome your comments because I think you're spot on. We can't just look at the uh, at the efficiency we or the energy. We have to look at the actual carbon uh, footprint if that's the policy goal. Any more comments, questions? Not seeing any. Do we want to have somebody put forward a vote on receipt of the report? All in favor, carried. Move to recommendation. Thank you. So vote. All in favor, carried. All right. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. Uh, moving forward to the one spot trail management options for 1893 Spike Road. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair and Directors, and Mark Hart, uh, Parks Planner, is here to present this report and answer your questions.
comments? Thank you. Um, through the chair, uh, thanks for having us. Um, here today to continue the process, we've had this conversation going for some time now about this property at 1893 Spike Road. Um, and we're here today to present some management options for that site. Um, specifically, we're seeking board support uh, for, uh, for a park management plan for the site, which would focus primarily on conservation. We'd also like direction to report to KFN on our progress on the plan um, to uh, in, institute a, an interim name for the park, which would be par, uh, Spike Road Park, and to amend our budget to shift $25,000 to support the planning for the site. I'll tell you, I know some of you are familiar with the site, but I'll just give you some details about the, about the site. These are, this slide may be a little confusing. It's two pictures of the same property. <laughs> Uh, it's, a, it's a rural property, it's 30 hectares in size, it's zoned a, a rural ALR, um, it has been used by previous owners uh, for agricultural production, uh, CVRD now owns it, I should say. Um, and we recently had an agricultural capability assessment done and it was found to be adequate for soil bound agricultural production. Um, that said, about 85% of the property is within the sensitive ecosystem inventory and wetland, uh, primarily bog, although some actual wetland as well. And, and then the dry land portion is largely surrounding the road dedication, which bisects the property, uh, unopened road dedication. Uh, and that's about five hectares of land. Uh, the unopened road dedication is the former Comox logging railway. Um, the CVRD has a license to operate a seasonal evacuation route on the, on the, on the road, and we have a license to extend the one spot trail. Uh, I think that's everything I want to tell you about the site. Uh, we do have some management options for you to consider today. Um, the first of which, um, which is our our preferred option is to uh, treat the entire site as a park um, for park use and conservation. Uh, that's aligned with our, our resolution from uh, February, 2022. Uh, when we came to you to, at that time, we asked uh, to, for permission to purchase the site for conservation purposes and to allow us to extend the one spot trail. Uh, and we continue to hope to do that with the site. Um, that said, there is some costs associated with this, uh, the um, demolition or uh, we'll actually, we actually found someone to do a deconstruction of the residences on the site and, uh, and, and that will be a, a costly endeavor. Um, and as with all parks, there's an ongoing maintenance cost associated with it. Another option that we considered um, is, a, is rental of a portion of the property. Uh, so we would continue to use most of the property for, for, uh, for a park, but then a portion of it would be rented off uh, for residential use. Um, th the benefit of this would be to maintain a, a market rental unit in the housing stock in the Valley. Um, and that the CVRD would re receive some revenue from that rent. Uh, the costs of course are that, um, the, the primary residence would require quite a bit of renovations to bring it up to code and to make it to safe to habitat or to live in, uh, including like replacement of the well and heating system. So it's, it's not a, it won't be cheap. Uh, we would also continue to operate the remainder of the land as a park. And so those costs would continue on. And um, to be frank, the CVRD parks department is not ideally suited to being a landlord, so we would also um, probably need to hire a property manager to to manage that rental property, uh, which would further erode the benefits of the revenue. Um, a third option would be to lease the part, lease a portion of the property out for seasonal programming, uh, recreation, and nature-based programming. Um, 
obvious benefits to the public. However, the property is quite remote and um, and and may, is not super accessible to most people. Um, we anticipate that we could generate some revenue from that, but as with the rental option, the costs of of bringing the property up to a standard where we could do this would be quite a bit, and we wouldn't see any real financial benefits for the next 10 years from this option. Uh, I should also say that we've reached out, um, we started a few initial conversations with people on this and we have found no one interested in operating this site for nature-based or recreation programming. The final option is uh, to subdivide and sell the property, a portion of the property. Um, this is obviously attractive from a from a one-time revenue perspective, we could we estimate that we could generate about six hundred thousand uh, dollars from the sale. However, um, our policy doesn't support a subdivision in this property, and um, and then we would be back in the same position that we were at the beginning with potential conflict with the one spot trail and uh, and the potential new new owner. Um, so just looking at it from Oh, and I'll just remind you that our, our our preferred option is the conservation option. Oops. I'm not sure what happened there. Uh, there we go. So looking at it from a policy perspective, um, conservation meets most of the strategic drivers and goals of the board. Uh, we feel that it's the best option from from a range of perspectives, including um, including policy alignment, both like CBRD policy and provincial policy, operational feasibility, technical feasibility, and social acceptability. I think there's a really great opportunity here to integrate this piece of land with the one spot trail and to and to extend the one spot trail. This one property um, will help us fill a four and a half kilometer gap in the one spot trail. Um, it's a, it's a big win for the for the region and for active transportation, and that's all I have to say. <laughs> Correct, agree. Thank thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mark. Um, my first question is uh, around the actual bog itself. Is there any possibility of getting carbon credits? Because my understanding is that bogs are like seven percent, or seven times more carbon, uh, uh, seven percent more carbon absorption than even forestry and whatever. They're huge. So, is there any possibility in the future? Do you think of actually getting some revenue, or at least being able to buy some of our own carbon credits from from the bog itself? Um, through the chair, thank thank you for that question. Uh, Parks hasn't looked into that option. Um, we have I have had um, sort of informal conversations with Mike Zabarski, who is involved with the with our um, climate change and and carbon planning, uh, and that's something that staff could look at and come back to the committee with more information on. And I guess the, the next question would be um, if I get two of them. Um, Around the one spot trail itself, uh, you may be aware that uh, there are residents uh, at the other end of that one spot trail off Endall Road on Sturgis Road that live uh, south of the makeshift bridge that, uh, and, they're, and they're concerned about, uh, with a little subdivision that was put in there years ago. It's, a, it, it's not a proper MOTI bridge. Um, it's... Uh, it there's issues around uh the response from the fire department and and uh also uh cement trucks building whatever in that little area so i wonder if there was any consideration of maybe having a um, discussion with moti around uh, actually putting in uh, something a little more than than just a trail to that area just wondering if you you're live to that conversation at all um, so the road remains unopened uh, to the property line, and I think extends beyond the property line. But it, it seems inevitable that that road will eventually be opened. Um, okay. And I know that Moti recently did some put some investments into that bridge, 
uh, it's still a very rural bridge. <laughs> Um, but in terms of conversations with extending the, like opening the road dedication, we did talk about the possibility of opening the road through this site um, and the cost to us would be considerable. Um, and so we aren't pursuing that at this time, but it seems to me that in, in, this, in the future, at some point that road will be open. So that would be a multi-decision, obviously. Yeah, so I can tell the residents that uh, Keep pestering Modi. Thank you. I did have one uh, question or comment in regards to, I know uh, just a few months ago, we had the young agrarians come in uh, as delegation and put forward concerns and interests in regards to um, accessing parcels of property for, for folks to go and do farming activities. So I'm just wondering if this is something that has been explored or, or could be explored or should be explored. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we haven't actually reached out to the young agrarians, but that's a great idea. Um, and that would fall into the lease option. Um, and it could be a it could be a really good fit with our park system. Um, and and parks would be happy to go ahead and, and explore that option if that's what the committee would like us to do. Um, I would just caution that that um, depending on how that would play out, there's some possible liabilities that we could incur through that process, uh, which shouldn't be our primary consideration, but we are obliged to take care of this, the, <laughs> our parks. And, and I understand your comment, there are concerns with regards to liability, but I think there's agreements and stuff that uh, at the end of the day could be uh, pursuit or whatever between both parties to address some of those, I would think. Uh, Edwin Green? Thank you. Uh, just uh, being that we haven't had a site visit on that, I, I would uh, think that it may not be a, a, a prime candidate for that, being that it's not great farmland to begin with. So. Thanks. Any other comments, questions? Great. Thanks for the presentation, guys. So uh, in regards to motion or vote on uh, receipt of the report. Thank you, all in favor, Carrie. Recommendation. Yep. We just voted on receipt of the report. Recommendation for the second. Okay, thank you. All, all in favor? Carried. Thank you. Thank you, Chair and Directors. Mark Harrison is here to present the Beach Fire Report and answer any of your questions. Mark? Yeah, thank you, Russell. Um, through the chair, at the uh, January 30th ESC, um, there was a request made to look further into the Beach Fire Program uh, to review it um, upon adoption of the recommended budget. So we are here to um, seek your guidance on the future of the Beach Fire Program. So this program has been cancelled for the past three years. It is a managed program that does provide low cost recreation opportunities to the residents of the Comox Valley. Um, a letter was sent at the request of the directors to the town of Comox to see if they would be willing to help finance the program, but there was um, no willingness um, indicated to help finance that. Um, we also did receive a letter from the North Island Medical Health Officer, and she did indicate that the health impacts of the wood smoke on adjacent residents would be fairly small. So staff are recommending that the Beach Fire Program be reinstated and further that $50,000 be transferred from our reserves to help fund the program. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, I do have one question. I'm not sure if it would be able to be answered today or not, but in regards to the community work funds um, that are being received if there's a means of using those funds to uh, help out with those costs that we're talking about. 
Yeah, through the chair, thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna actually ask uh, Kevin DeVille to step in and answer that question for me, please. Thank you through the chair to the directors. Um, community works funds likely would not be an eligible um, option in this regard, given that community works funds are largely in the, uh, reserved for capital related projects. And given this is a more of an operational type function of the service, uh, it would probably be better suited to uh, be funded as staff have put forward. Thanks, Director Grease. Uh, thanks. I'm suffering from the same issue that the Director Arbor is suffering from, and being that we were down in Imo all week, talk a block full of everything. So uh, I opened my package up yesterday and this morning at five o'clock in the morning over it. So I, I just don't see the hours of operation. Traditionally, isn't it from the um, uh, Victoria Day weekend through to Labor Day weekend? Is that what it is? So it's just those, those that time frame of. Uh, basically two months and a bit, two months and a week, so or a couple of weeks, so say two and a half months. So my question would be, um, uh, if you also consider the fact that there's fire bans on for the majority of the summer, especially if you get another heat dome or something like that, then my understanding is um, that uh, the operation of, of uh, of the actual uh, program is, is going to be fairly limited. Is that correct? I mean, it it, it does fall under the, the Comox Fire Department jurisdiction, right? So it's up to the, their chief that when it's a fire ban on, correct? Um, through the chair. So that part of Goose Spit, actually, there is no, it isn't under any fire jurisdiction. So what we have done in the past is to um, request a fire permit from the Comox Fire Department, and then they gen they generally have issued us one, but it isn't actually technically under their jurisdiction. Um, you're correct that it is a rather short program, but I think that from the May to that September is approximately a four month um, program. Um, generally, over the okay. course of the over the course of the summer. Um, we do have uh, fire bans, so we, we do follow um, provincial guidance okay. on that. Uh, and typically, there is a, a section during the summer where, where it does get cancelled. So it could be quite considerable. It, it, yeah, I mean, it all just depends on, on the weather and, and what the um, provincial guidance is at, for the summer. And if I may, um, are we looking to have uh, some interns looking after this program, or do we have a a group like uh, the Boy Scouts or somebody is going to be doing it, doing the doing the program for us, or are we going to be doing it through our uh, our contractors? Or yeah, I, I, through the chair. I mean, at this stage, we're just seeking guidance on whether we want to um, actually look at operating the program again um, for us to then implement the operational piece. It would be through a contractor. Okay. Um, but we would we would need to um, find a contractor and find someone who's kind of willing to take on that that program. So that hasn't been started at this time. Fair enough. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Um, it, the, the, your comment perked up my interest a little bit. So um, did I just hear you say that? It falls outside the Comox jurisdiction, but they're issuing a permit for it. So, does that do some of our fire departments issue permits for things outside? Like, could I issue a permit for Bowser from the Fanny Bay uh, uh, fire department? Like, I'm just trying to understand how do you issue a permit for something that's outside your jurisdiction? Yeah, through the chair. I mean, that's that's a great question, but I, I don't have the the answer. Unfortunately, to that question, um, you know, potentially Doug has that question that has an answer to that, but I'm not sure how it exactly works. But I know that what we've done in the past is to secure a permit from the Comox Fire Department um, because they actually they have jurisdiction over the Willamar Bluff residents. Um, so they technically um, would like to. Like it just makes sense for them to kind of look look after that for us in case we have an event or something happens down there. But um, it's just been done through um, 
their their good graciousness, yeah. I guess. Thanks for clarifying. I, I can relate a little bit to that in the sense that, you know, the part of Royston is part of the Rural Cumberland service, and but we're under contract with them for um, servicing that area. And I imagine that the residents of Willamar and Area B and, and such are probably covered by contract through uh, the Comox. What I'm hearing you say is maybe that the goose pit area is outside that boundary area. I just would ask staff to make sure that there's not a liability issue that could arise from that historically anecdotal <laughs> information uh, around getting a permit for something that's outside your jurisdiction, both to protect the Comox Fire Department and ourselves. And second, um, can you expand a little bit? I mean, I I I I, um, I saw the um, initially when you made a recommendation not to bring back the beach fire program, there was concern around ecological impacts, which is also uh, presented in this report. But you didn't describe a lot what those impacts may be. Are you able to expand a little bit? Because I, it's mostly sand, but I'm I'm just wondering. And I mean, you do write that the park is at exceeding. <laughs> Uh, carrying capacity right now from staff's opinion and I think back in the fall you said there was a concern about bringing it back because of that so if, you, if you'd like to uh, expand a little bit more on that aspect I'd appreciate it. Yeah certainly um, through the chair I, I think that, that that would that concern from an ecological impact is largely just to do to numbers so as you add programs to a park you're then inviting more people to to come. Usually beach fires are in the evenings, so it's not typically when you get large amounts of people. So you're just bringing more people onto the site, and by doing that, you have a potential for more ecological impact on the site. Mark, do you have data to uh, support that comment? Uh, through the chair, like in terms of numbers? Yeah. Because um, I, I mean, I live quite close by. I drive down there quite a bit, and in the evenings, there are a lot of people down there. So to say that there's not nearly as many people as there would be during the day, I, I'm not so sure about that. But I'd like to see any data that you might have to support that. Yeah, through the chair, we do um, we do count um, vehicle numbers um, that go into Goose Pit every summer, um, and I can provide that breakdown to you. Any comments or any other questions? Adam? Just one, I guess it's another Zabarski question would be, uh, would we ever consider bringing back the beach bus? I think that was, was underutilized, unfortunately, but you know, talk about taking people out of cars, take them down there. I mean, after transportation is pretty good. You can get down there pretty easily. So if you don't, and if you're going to have a, a, a warden on, on site with firewood and all that, you don't even need to bring your, bring your vehicle basically. So, so I just wonder if maybe some, some discussion at transit around, around whether or not that's worth, worth uh, bringing back um, post COVID might be something to think about. Seeing no more questions, comments. Uh, so vote and receive a report. All in favor, carried. Uh, in regards to the recommendation. I'll move the recommendation. Thank you. Second. Director Arbor is second. All in favor. Period. Want to do lunch? So do you, yeah. Okay. Do you want to do what we normally do, uh, work at lunch? Is it a work at lunch? No, so we'll get, uh, get started maybe with... Does that work? Okay. Thank you.
Hey, we'll give ourselves about two more minutes and we'll get started. All right, we'll get started. We're moving into Water Service South Extension Project Roadmap. Move your board. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair and Directors. And Chris LaRose is here to present the report, sort of supported by Charlie Gordon. Oh. <laughs> I can shout. Uh, thank you, Russell, and through the chair. Um, yeah, the team, we've provided or prepared this um, update report for the Water South Extension project on your agenda. Um, and Charlie and I have put together a brief presentation to help walk you through it. Uh, so just to start, a little bit of background. So the, the Royston Water Local Service Area currently receives water from the village of Cumberland. And they've done so you know, since well before we took over that service you know, about 13 years ago. So for the past few uh, water supply agreements with, uh, at least since I've been around for the last eight years, uh, the village of Cumberland has asked that we, or included within that water supply agreement, that we be looking for alternative sources. Uh, the village is looking forward and, um, and it anticipates that they will require this capacity that they currently send to Royston uh, to, to, to meet their own demand as their community grows. Um, and so about six years ago, uh, the CVRD started, uh, undertook an alternate source supply study. I looked at um, various ways of getting regional water from the regional system, which is the, the obvious alternate source, uh, down to, to Royston. And all of the options were, were quite expensive for, uh, for the service area. So fast forward to the... Um, conception and development of the Comox Valley Water Treatment Project. Um, so the MBA, Mutual Benefit Agreement that was finalized between the CVRD and the Comox First Nation in 2018, uh, committed the CVRD to championing the extension of regional water south um, to KFN development lands, which are located between Neon Bay and Royston. And then the grant application for that project that was also successful in attracting $7.4 million worth of funding towards, towards this project. So the Water South Extension project started as a collaboration between Royston and the KFN to satisfy both of these needs, objectives, uh, but it's since grown to include the city of Courtney, uh, who will benefit from additional water connections, um, connecting points as the pipe passes through South Courtney on its way to Point South. So Charlie, uh, as our manager of water and wastewater capital projects, is leading the Water South Extension project. He'll walk you through an overview of the project. Thanks, Chris. Um, there was a presentation. Yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll put that up. There we go. Thanks, Chris. If you could just go to the second slide. So, so as Chris mentioned, the uh, Water Service South Extension project was originally a project that was uh, envisaged with just Royston and, and the KFN Southlands. And that project actually came down Marsden Road up the connector and across to the top of Royston because the Royston water system is a 
reservoir at the top of Royston Road just before you go over the overpass. And so the, the, uh, that project was scoped based on getting water to that reservoir and then running the water as it does now down Royston Road and then servicing the Royston area that way and then a main heading down uh, the highway uh, or sorry, the ENN corridor to get water to the KFN Southlands. And that, that um, project was estimated at $14.8 million. And we received 50% grant funding, as, as Chris mentioned. So we received $7.4 million for that. Now, as part of that MBA with KFN, there was a commitment to try to find other partners to try to make it cheaper for both KFN, uh, well, primarily KFN, because it was an agreement with KFN, but trying to find other partners to make the project cheaper for, for those in the South. And that's where the, the current alignment, which you can see up on your screen, uh, was came up with, because once we were starting to work with City of Courtney, they were looking for more water supply to their southern region, specifically the Buckstone area, or the Ridge, as it's commonly known. Um, and so they said, hey, we, we're planning to do all these other capital upgrades to service our area. Let's do this together. And if you can go to the next slide, Chris. Um, you'll see here the, the, the cost estimate for that alternate project increased to $20 million. Now, the, the, with the grant fit funding uh, um, reduced from that, from that overall capital cost, you can see the apportionment for the, for the three parties there. Now, the, the apportionment is generally done for, for all of our projects uh, regarding the amount of benefit that those parties get from each portion of the line. So you can imagine the part of the line that is coming from the existing system heading south is shared three ways, and it's shared based on the amount of flow each organization requires as part of. So Royston needs a certain flow, Southern Courtney needs a certain flow, and KFN development needs a certain flow. And so for each portion of the line, whether it services all three parties or just one party or two parties, the, the costs are uh, apportioned in that way. And the only uh, interesting point that was, was uh, unique here was for the, for the apportionment calcs, when, it, when we did the original apportionment, we noticed that it had become cheaper for KFN uh, but it actually had to become more expensive for Royston to go to this alternate route. So the, uh, the apportionment was then reapportioned to make sure that bringing on that additional member into the team didn't make it more expensive for either of the two original members. So the Comox apportionment is still cheaper than the original project for them. The Royston is equivalent to the original project, their, their original cost escalated as it should be for the for the um, the new construction timeline and then the remainder sits with uh, the city of Courtney so that's the the apportionment for the three different parties next slide please also oh, the, the timeline so the the deadline for having this project complete uh, from the from a funding perspective is uh, March 2026 so that's that's the deadline we've been working towards such that we can utilize that $7.4 million from the province, which is very important for, uh, for the affordability of the project for all the partners, uh, specifically KFN and Royston. Um, however, there's, there's, there's a, some, some large milestones we need to, to hit to make sure that we, we know that each party is, is involved. And that's what we're coming to the EASC today, is to, to get the EASC EASC support to, to start moving in the direction of getting uh, the support for the Royston funding component. And, and another major milestone in that is the Comox First Nation treaty vote, which would confirm their interest in their Southlands and their interest in, in providing the, their portion of the funding for, for that. So what we're looking for today is that EASC support for this delivery approach which will then lead to meetings with the water committee and supporting how, how those CICCs would be repaid, which would be part of the um, building up the entire story for the residents of Royston. I'm a resident of Royston, so it's very important for me um, to understand the, the total cost of this project 
and moving from the, the, the uh, village of Cumberland water supply to the supply from the, the regional water service. So our intent is by the end of this year to try to have each of each three of the three parties on board with the way we want to go about this project and how they're going to fund it, which would allow us in capital projects to move forward into uh, detail design and then construction so that we have it done before the, the deadline for the funding expires. Um, so I'm going to hand you back to Chris on the, the details of that, but that's the kind of why we're coming to the, the table today and why it's important in a larger picture of the, the overall scope of the project. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so in anticipation of uh, some questions about, you know, approximately what the cost impacts are to, to the, will be to the residents of Royston for the project, we included in the report a high level estimate of what the what kind of what the the components of that of that cost to the residents will be and, and what the approximate values are. Uh, so the table shows um, four pieces. So the first being the the Royston's share, the fund Royston's share of the, the the capital project. So as you saw on the previous slide from Charlie, there, um, th th this this is uh, broken out uh, to, to the approximate cost per connection. So roughly seventeen hundred and forty dollars per property would go towards paying Royston's share of the overall project. Um, then we've earmarked an additional $1,000 per connection for related capital works. It'll be costs that, that are required for the switchover, but, but only borne by, by Royston. And then the CICC that, that Charlie was talking about. So that's that's currently set at $3,389. So that's, um, that's in place for the Comox Valley water system per connection that joins the system. And then finally, there's a, a, um, a term that we're calling the amalgamation equalization. So um, if you bring your minds back, for those of you that were here and involved in the um, amalgamation of um, the various water local service areas around the Comox Valley water system into the function 305, um, one of the key parts to that process was um, and this was a requirement by the province. They were very set on ensuring fairness between um, service participants. So our, our expectation is that, um, so from a, uh, an infrastructure perspective, it's as Charlie described, uh, from a governance perspective, we expect to amalgamate, to work towards amalgamation of the Royston Water Local Service Area into the Comox Valley Water Local Service Area. Um, and at that point, it's important and the province makes sure from a fairness perspective that if there is a difference in relative uh, reserve balances between service areas, that there be some mechanism for um, bringing them in line. Um, so just a, a, a cursory assessment of the relative reserve balances between the Comox Valley and Royston Water Local Service Area suggests that Royston will need to contribute um, some additional funds to bring them up to to that to the level that's currently in place for the Comox Valley Water Local Service Area. So total estimated cost per connection is you know, between the seven and eight thousand dollar level. Um, so I just want to highlight that these are high level estimates. They're just for the purpose of, of, of bringing us along in the process now, and, and they are they are definitely subject to change. Um, they'll be advanced over the summer and then fed into the comprehensive rate review that's planned for the for this service. Um, so it's somewhat distinct. It's not driven by this project, but it's happening this year, and it's a, it'll be a good opportunity to feed these costs in, um, and based on a funding model, uh, uh, what the what the actual cost impact will be for the residents of Royston. Um, we're not currently forecasting the need for an ascent process or the the need for long term borrowing. So we're, we're hoping to be able to fund this project through a combination of reserves. Um, and um, community works funds, potentially some current communities funds, um, and then potentially a small amount of short-term borrowing. Um, the amalgamation in terms of timing, we've laid out the steps that will be required in the in the staff report. In terms of timing, it will have to ha it'll happen prior to connection of the regional source, um, which is expected in late 25 or 26. And then finally, that amalgamation equalization component um, would be recovered through a parcel tax in the same way that we've established ones for Sandwick and um, a couple of the other smaller services that were amalgamated into the Comox Valley 
water local service area. And finally, just to just in summary, before we hand it over to the committee for questions, um, the project's definitely been long anticipated. It's now getting close to implementation. The project honors the commitments that um, we've made to the Comox, uh, the village of Cumberland and the residents of Royston. Um, it, it, it does represent a significant cost to the residents of Royston, particularly when, when seen in combination with the other upcoming costs, um, potential costs relating to sewer and waste collection. So we don't definitely don't want to lose sight of those when we, in terms of when we're doing our modeling and, and communication. Um, and then finally, just to highlight that uh, this project will represent a very major upgrade to the Royston Water Local Service Area, both in terms of infrastructure and also in terms of economies of scale, in terms of joining a much larger system and benefiting from those economies of scale. So that's it, that's it, that's it from us. So happy to answer any questions. Director, Director Arbor? Yeah, thanks to staff for the comprehensive update on that. Um, so if I get it right, um, the Kentwood area would remain part of the Cumberland, uh, continue to be served by Cumberland. There was a map in the report. Maybe I, I misread it, but uh, yeah, so, that so, can be my first question, yeah. Yeah, so there is a little bit of uncertainty right. uh, about that component. So we've, um, in our... Because otherwise, my assumption is because otherwise we'd have to push the water uphill to their area, right? Is that the concern? Exactly. Yeah. So there is a, there is a bit of a question mark remaining on that section. So we're yeah. we're in the process of, of chatting with the village to understand what Great. they're interested or are willing to to entertain, and then also doing further analysis. So we've some of that related capital works line item would provide for a pump zone if if that's the direction that we that we go in. Yeah. Um, I think our preference would be to uh, to remain uh, for that area to remain on the Cumberland system for some period of time after the conversion. Yeah, thanks for the heads up on that. I was yeah. talking to me, the mayor of Cumberland on, on that, this very project recently, and um, I, I didn't know that, that that might be a possibility, but from my conversation, uh, it didn't seem like it was an extreme need to transfer over everything or something like that, like their their growth projections are, are uh, moving along a clip, but not a crazy clip. So yeah. <laughs> I, I think politically, there's probably going to be some some openness in Cumberland to, uh, to satisfy the residents of Kentwood, maybe not only in the short term, maybe long term. It'd be interesting to know what the, the extra rate is if, if we have to pump up in the rest of that. So um, in regards to, um, and thank you, yeah, I agree with you that if we can reduce the cost to Royston residents um, through securing and uh, committing some grants, that, that is helpful. That's I think that's the object of further reports uh, later on today and, and into the future. You did raise one question that, uh, not quite a red flag, but just a concern, I guess, that from your presentation, um, you said um, that treaty would help confirm KFN's uh, participation in the project. When I hear a statement like that, I hear that if the treaty didn't go through, is it possible that their interest in the project could diminish or or change in nature? Uh, and if if you don't want to talk about it today, I'm just raising it as a question coming out of your presentation that I might like more information on in the future. Or I guess it's all coming up pretty quick. But uh, but otherwise, what would be the alternatives? Um, would that uh, would we would we need a complete revisit of the project if if that were the case? There's no doubt um, that the Comox First Nation are, are the, the key participant in mm -hmm. the in the project, as uh, being the largest, as you can see from the allocation that is proportional to the to the scale of development that's expected in the in the south. Um, so if if the if the KFN's participation were in question or went in a different direction, it would certainly cause a, a, a us to pause and and reassess. Um, the project you know, would likely not proceed as as currently envisioned. Um, so there would be some pretty major changes to the concept if um, the KFN were, were not to proceed. Okay, thank you. So if, if it's possible to ask staff, uh, I love your timeline, but we all support all the recommendations today, um, but maybe for staff, if uh, next opportunity to meet with KFN, if we can have a touch base on this project with the new council so that we start to understand that, that uh, I think that could be valuable information for us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Director Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm just wondering, my question is, uh, when Courtney extended their boundaries, 
uh, south from the Ansfield Center and, and took in that piece of Royston um, that you can see on the map where the border is now. So is the Royston water system still supplying water to those residents north of that line? Or are they, have they been diverted into the Courtney system already? Correct. They have been diverted into the Courtney They have? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Any other questions? So do we have a vote on receipt of the report? First and second. Thank you. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Vote. All in favor? Carried. Thank you, gentlemen. Development cost charge exemptions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. This is a report that was referred to you by the board. It is a report that outlined uh, considerations of development cost charges and when they may provide for exemptions. Mark Rutten, uh, who developed the original report, is, is available. Perhaps I'll just ask him to make a brief introduction and then answer any of your questions. Yeah, thank you, Russell. <clears throat> we provided this uh, staff report to the board. Um, to uh, to let them know um, how development cost charges are put in place, uh, mostly related to the water service and the sewer service at the time, and then the exemptions that were considered at the time those bylaws were put in place. And those exemptions, those affordable housing exemptions, were really restricted to secondary suites, and that was an interest of the advisory committee for water and sewer and of the sewage commission and water committee at the time. Um, those bylaws are due to be updated um, after water master planning is completed and sewer master planning. So that'll, that'll be taking place this year and hopefully wrapping up by the end of the year or close to it. And then we would consider an update of those water and sewer bylaws. Um, and then the only other thing to say, maybe not so much about this report, is that within the Electoral Area Services Committee purview, there are three such DCC bylaws in, in place. Um, for One for Black Creek Oyster Bay, which is a bylaw that we developed, the CVRD, and then two others, one for Royston and one for Union Bay, which were developed by the Improvement Districts and inherited by the CVRD when we took over those, those services. So I'll just leave it at that. And if, if you have questions, Chris and I are here to, to hopefully answer those. Director. Thanks, Chair. So I, I maybe I'll just make you repeat. Uh, again, the reports have been uh, difficult to read fully this weekend. Um, what you're saying is we're going to do the water master planning and switch master planning for, I imagine, the uh, for which service for the Comox Valley water system or for yep. all the Comox Valley? Yeah, so for system? the Comox Valley water system, we're doing water master planning yeah. this year. And um, we we started that process a while ago. It, it did get delayed just due to internal resources. And now we're restarting that again this year. And for sewer master planning, we're, we're further along and about to start a value management planning process for that. Okay. But but those two services are not within the purview of the EASC, but that, that is the schedule for those uh, updates. Right, because we have kind of done the water master planning. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, through the chair. Uh, apologies, I was starting to get in the back and forth. Um, if I may, because um, I, I realize that we have kind of uh, done a significant piece of work around the Union Bay one, and I'm wondering if if what you're saying is that are are you going to propose a DCC program that is standardized across everything? Because Union Bay is obviously facing a pretty major development, and I'm wondering if you, we would have a DCC program specific to that area or whether the thought of staff is to create a standardized DCC program across the entire valley. I can speak to that too. I can speak oh, to that too. Um, it, would be, it would not be standardized in that the interest and values and potential of exemptions will vary very much within municipal areas compared to rural areas. And as you said, the demands and interests of the services within those local service areas is very unique and different. 
the only consideration will be the Comox Valley Water Services, which are part of the um, the wa Comox Lake Water System, right? There will be some, some interest there, but Union Bay, Black Creek Oyster Bay, I see as being very different and, and unique. Chris, do you have a follow up? Uh, just to, I just to reiterate what uh, Russell highlighted there that we do have funds earmarked in the um, Black Creek Oyster Bay and the uh, Union Bay um, financial plans to undertake DCC studies this year. So, they, like as Russell mentioned, fully distinct and separate, based entirely on the projects facing each of those services, um, and so that should be implemented by the end of this year, early early next. So, so that's the the value, the terms, our, our intention is to have the terms of the of the DCC bylaws consistent amongst our water local service areas. So not the, the dollar value will change depending on the service area, but the terms potentially including any adjustment based on today's topic would be consistent across the, uh, the service areas. Any other comments, questions? Oh, vote on receipt of the report then. All carried. All in favor, sorry, carried. Moving on to item number nine, the Grand Lake Demon Island Water Service Treatment Update. Thank you very much, Sharon Directors and uh, Chris LaRose will present this report with support of our engineering analyst, Kaylee. Thank you, Russell, and through the chair, just in the process of sharing my screen for a presentation. There we go. Yeah, so um, we've created this very brief PowerPoint to help us guide us through a summary of the report on your agenda. So the purpose of this report is to follow up on the January 30th amendment to do further analysis and report back with a recommended path forward. So that analysis that we've done since then has raised more questions and concerns than it's answered. And it's clear from all of the correspondence received from uh, residents, from concerned residents, that there's a high level of anxiety about the project and the future of the service. So many of the residents are uh, are shocked at the steep increases that are in anticipated for the service, um, talking about you know, potentially abandoning the service. And then others see the value in the community water system, even at much higher cost and want it to proceed regardless. So there's quite a range of of feelings in the community. Um, given the scale of the costs facing the service costs and decisions um, and the level of concern from the residents, it's particularly important that we build on the work done by the Graham Lake Improvement District trustees uh, to ensure that all the required due diligence is, is completed before bringing forward a recommended path forward. So we, yeah, like I said, we prepared this brief presentation to help describe the additional analysis that we're recommending and that we're seeking funding for. Um, and then also uh, highlighting some of the key points and constraints that are inherent to this water system that we'll be communicating, um, that propo we're proposing to communicate to the residents at a May information session. Bear with me, my computer has frozen. There we go. <laughs> So in the report, we've highlighted seven uh, distinct pieces of analysis or study work that we'd like to undertake uh, to help inform a, a recommended path forward. So the first one is a um, is a, a high level study into source water availability. Um, you know, anecdotally, there's plenty of water in the lake for the system. Um, we're, we're well underneath our uh, license capacity limits for the for the lake. That being said. You know, given the scale of the costs facing the service, I think it's, it's definitely uh, responsible due diligence just to undertake a bit of a study to understand where we are now and where we're likely to be in the future in terms of water availability from that surface water source. Um, the second one is uh, is regarding the dam. It is a, it's a small dam, but it does have a relatively, um, it, I think it's a medium risk in terms of the, the, uh, the potential impacts of, of a failure. Um, we'd like to better understand, um, undertake a, a risk assessment and understand what, if any, upgrades are required, what maintenance is required, 
um, so that we have a full grasp on the cost and the risk implications of that infrastructure. Um, we want to we plan to undertake a, a condition assessment of the lake take. There's not a cost associated with this. Um, if if there is, it's, it's very minimal. Um, more of a, a visual inspection. Um, um, and then optical treatment technology. So th this is a um, th this is a big one. We've we we, we supported the Graham Lake Improvement District through their options analysis. Uh, that ended up selecting and then piloting a specific treatment technology. We are working. We are already working with and plan to work uh, more with the engineers to understand: is there another potential technology? Is there ways of of further tightening the belt and, and reducing the cost of this solution? Um, so that's a, that's a really important one. Um, water conservation. We want to we want to better understand what the opportunity is to implement. You know, if we implemented water meters and a and a conservation rate structure. How much savings? How many? How much reduction could we accomplish, and how could that help further reduce the costs of treatment, um, and also implement some um, some high level kind of controls at that plant to help us better uh, monitor and remotely control that system to help further reduce the cost for the service um, condition. We want to assess the condition of the distribution infrastructure to help us. Better nail down the the the, the the expected replacement year that'll help us to fine tune our our financial model for the service. You know, is it ten years? Is it twenty years? That'll have a big impact on the amount of savings that will be, that will be needed by the service. And then finally, um, some additional financial analysis and modeling to understand exactly um, what the financial implications of uh, of all of these assets are on the service. So the total total financial need for this is. We're estimating forty-five thousand, and we have a motion on the report recommending or asking that um, that that uh, be funded through community work funds. That's a piece, and then just some key points that I wanted to highlight, and these would be um, these are kind of some of the takeaways from the work that we've done to date, and would be some of the key messages that would be communicated at a um, a information session. The first one, just highlighting the the, the poor economies of scale for this service. So we've got you know, approximately in today dollars between seven to eight million dollars worth of water infrastructure that is being used to supply, treat, and distribute water for 90, 91 homes between uh, Graham Lake and Devon Island. That's a it's a pretty high value for a relatively few number of homes, and that's you know largely to you know, to blame for the, the remaining points here for the second one being that, you know, there's been a lot of attention placed on the water treatment project, you know, most recent estimate at $3.4 million, but the distribution system and the asset replacement cost for all of this are, are, are for all of the, the rest of the infrastructure is comparable in value to that, to that treatment project without the accompanying grant funding. Um, the next point is that just, you know, one of the pieces of analysis that we did, which is summarized in the report, is that just from an asset replacement um, perspective alone for the treatment plant and the mains would be roughly $1,600 per property per year, assuming that, uh, that you know, we had been saving forever, we were able to, to replace these this infrastructure without any debt servicing costs. Um, and then the next point is that once other infrastructure and operating costs is considered, the, the minimum sustainable revenue for the services is likely around the three thousand dollar per property level. Um, and then finally, that given that you know that the service hasn't been saving up for for, for this infrastructure um, in 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 anywhere near like the level required, and that borrowing will therefore be required. The rates will need to be significantly higher for the service for you know, approximately on the 20 to 30 year basis in order to catch up. So that $3,000 per property per year assumes that no borrowing for asset replacement, which is really not the case. Um, so these are these are some of the constraints facing the service and that will be, will be communicating to the residents and then kind of wrapping our heads around you know, a, a recommended path forward over the summer before reporting back to the committee in the fall. So the, yeah, so just, and to summarize in May, so we are proposing to undertake a, a, um, an information session, plan to update residents about what's happening. 
describes the additional due diligence that's underway or planned, describe the timeline moving forward, introduce them to some of the, 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 the terms and concepts and that I uh, just summarized on the last slide. And then very importantly, solicit some feedback in person from residents about what's important to them as we consider the, the fate of the service. That's it for me. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Carver. Yeah, thanks, Chair, and uh, yeah, thanks, staff. I think that um, this is the one report I did wrote, read from beginning to end uh, last night, and uh, I think it hits on all the points that I've, I've mentioned over the last couple of meetings around the need for that extra due diligence when you consider such a high investment. And you are correct. Over the last month, I'm receiving lots of feedback. Some people very upset with my comments, and some absolutely thrilled. <laughs> At the end of the day, this is difficult issue and potentially divisive for the community. And um, and I think uh, somewhere in the middle, I do get some emails that people are like, we need to just take our time and figure out what's the best action and try to bring people together and try to not leave anyone behind as we move on this. I think the, the capacity to pay is something that I've definitely heard about. For some people, it's, as you said in your staff report, it's it's it doesn't really matter and for others. And then another one I've heard a lot is, Danielle, please help us secure more grants. So there's some people that are saying we need more grants for this project. And I saw that analysis will be uh, part of the work we will conduct, whether uh, we can go back to the funder, uh, whether there are new pots. I know the ICIP program is ending, but um, I know through FCM that we're starting to have discussion around the next round of water funding in Canada. And small systems are really at the forefront. I think any system between one and, and 500 doors in Canada, they're all suffering from uh, the financial pressure tied to new regulation, not just in British Columbia, but everywhere else. So I did talk to our MLA again about the, the problem we have, that uh, how sad it is that despite securing a $1.3 million grant, homeowners would still be facing that kind of cost. And lastly, anecdotally, um, I was talking to another counselor who happens to have been involved with uh, managing the Mount Cain water system and uh, the ski resort, but it's a bigger water system than the Graham Lake. And he was saying that over there, it's almost the cost is lower uh, because it's groundwater. And <laughs> so I think you're right. There's a pipe replacement, which ties to asset management, which, which ties to a big catch up that needs to happen from years prior. Uh, but on the water treatment, I'm really happy. So I think staff is really nailing it with this report. I also would like to address, because I know people will be watching this, there's been questions around, are we going to lose the grant because of Daniel Arbor and the shenanigans <laughs> of wanting to do due diligence? And I think in the staff report, it clearly speaks that we're not going to put that in, in uh, jeopardy, that uh, we will either ask, we will consult with our current funder, talk about the challenges that we're having, uh, and if need be, ask for an extension, which is not atypical for these types of grants. So I just want to assure people that we are not acting in a kind of uh, uh, knee-jerk reaction or anything like that. We're, we're doing diligence on, on all fronts. So I really want to thank staff for that comprehensive approach. And when you have a date for uh, the information session, please pass it along. I'll try to see if I can be there. Thank you, Pete. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I as well have been getting a lot of emails on this one. I guess I made some comments that some people liked, some people didn't like, but um, obviously we've got a water system here that is above and beyond uh, what any other residents are paying in the Comox Valley. It's astronomical by comparison. And my question would be, uh, in my mind, I think that uh, some of the capital work stallers should go to the area most in need. And uh, I'd put this out there right now that I think that Area C could possibly help out on some of this with our, because we were in a pretty good position uh, in the, uh, the uh, Oyster Bay, Black Creek Oyster Bay system right now. We got that pretty well under control, and um, so I'm just asking uh, staff: is, is there any possibility of uh, contributing to this cost? Uh, 
Who's, who's going to draw the trigger? I was going to. I was, I was planning to redirect it to, to Kevin just to comment on on that on that welcome suggestion. Kevin. Through the chair to direct grief. So, if I'm understanding your question correctly, would there be an opportunity for Area C to contribute, say, some dollars from community works funds to help support this? Short answer would be yes. Um, I mean, while we do allocate dollars through the community works funds program to each of the reasons based on that population mix, uh, you know, we certainly also understand that at times there are projects that are seen of a, of a more regional import or nature uh, where other areas could then contribute to that. Uh, the extension of sewer services health being a prime example of where that's certainly happened in the past. Chris, did you have another comment or any other questions, comments? I get a motion to, uh, I'm sorry, a vote on receipt of the report. Thank you. All in favor? So vote on recommendation. All in favor, Terry. Next, growing community grants allocation. Second. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Lucy Rutterk is here to present this report and uh, answer any of your questions. Thank you. Lucy. We do have a, a short PowerPoint um, to take you through this report. Thank you. So good afternoon, um, Chair Hardy and directors. Uh, just have a very short presentation here to help take you through the Growing Communities Fund allocation report. So as directors are aware, the province announced the new Growing Communities Fund, $1 billion from the province's 2022-2023 budget surplus will be distributed to local governments. The primary objective of that fund is to increase the local housing supply with investment in community infrastructure and amenities. So funds are to be used for one-off projects and not for ongoing operational type costs. So this was very welcome news to the CVRD. The $4,497,000 allotment will certainly help to alleviate financial pressures for those chosen services. The fund allotment to the CVRD is calculated as you see there on the right of that screen, the half a million dollars in a base amount, per capita values for both regional district and for rural um, population. And lastly, growth-based funding for the rural areas. So while that this grant is structured um, to support the rural challenges, the intent of the fund is not to have the funds solely allocated in the electoral areas. So just before getting any further into the details, I just wanted to ensure to be clear about the process being used to get endorsed allocations for this fund. The grant fund, it stipulates that regional district boards must endorse the funding allocations. And the input and the feedback from this table, of course, is very important to that. So therefore, with this report that's here today, uh, directors are being asked to consider the recommendations uh, for allocating the funds. And then tomorrow, April 18th, at the CBRD board meeting, this report has been provided for information. The board at that time can provide advice or direction at tomorrow's meeting if they so wish. On May 9th, included with the CBRD board meeting, will be resolutions coming from today's EAC meeting. And on May 9th, the regional district board may approve those allocations uh, for this fund. 
More time can also be taken if, um, if required as the deadline to actually have endorsements for all the allocations isn't until December 2023. So it can take more time if that's needed as we walk through this process. So with multiple services under financial strain, it would be difficult to determine where to use these funds. So EMT recognized that a strategic approach would be necessary for recommending funds, the fund use. A set of principles were established and those are included in your report. I'm not gonna go through them and just went through a basic ranking exercise. So primarily projects within the board's current financial plan were considered projects needed to meet the eligibility criteria, uh, which the eligible costs are pretty typical of what we see coming from provincial or federal type funds like this. Um, basically, it's capital infrastructure infrastructure being constructed and also owned by the CBRG. Um, funds um, are very limited when we look at that category or um, eligible costs are very li limited when we look at that category of affordable housing. Um, the use currently in our situations that we see in CVRD, we could not, there is no eligible type projects that are underway right now. And this is really similar to what we found as we did the investigation on affordable housing type projects with our community works funds as well. On the right side, the projects that rank the highest as we came through this exercise were things um, for fire services, completion of parks and trails, asset management type um, needs for recreation, water projects south, and sewer campaigns. So your option one within your report is showing here. These are the recommended projects being put forth to the committee today for your consideration, discussion, et cetera. The recommendations, um, the recommended projects meet the intent of the grant, uh, underground infrastructure, fire services, parks and recreational projects are fundamental to supporting community growth. The list includes a mix of projects with support, which support the electoral areas and also benefit the region as a whole. The list targets services that are in financial, um, that are seeing financial risks. Uh, as we went through the 2023 financial uh, planning process, we saw the strains on multiple services going, and particularly going south. Um, you see the use of grant dollars being allocated for areas where we have planned um, debt, and that's for those multiple fire services. Um, and this will bring them some financial relief going well into the future years. For many projects listed, listed here, the growing community funds will allow those services to hang on to their reserve dollars, and that will help them to deal with financial pressures as they go to the future. I did want to note here that in determining this list of projects for growing community funds, leveraging and maximizing your community works funds was also considered. Within the next report that um, Kevin has here for you, um, you will see relationship between projects that are on this list with others that are there or maximizing the use of your community works funds as well. So uh, again, you'll see a bit of a theme there from a maximizing, um, maximizing these grant funds in order to alleviate debt. So also between the two funds, you'll also um, uh, note that grant funds are here um, layered across both these funds. That are that can actually be that can be leveraged for a lot of your small services, as we just heard about. Um, you know, one of your water services where you have a small population base. This is where uh, allocating grant funds can really help with those types of services to make things more affordable for them. Uh, and I just have two more notes for you on this particular side in relation to two projects that are on this list: Project Eleven and the additional office space. This project is not currently included within your financial plan. It is being recommended considering currently there is significant space issues at CVRD facilities. And project nine, the addition of 600,000 for sewer conveyance is included to bring benefits to area B. So prime, just some preliminary thoughts um, here on this, on adding this particular uh, dollar value and allocating these funds here to sewer conveyance. As the conveyance project rolls uh, forward, the injection of these dollars would be used to deal with some specific needs that um, are most likely to come up for area B. 
And at this point where allocation endorsement is complete, when the funds have been endorsed by the, the CBRD board, the grant funds will be layered into the 2023 financial plan. And this will allow financial calculations necessary just to be able to determine how will this uh, help with um, alleviating pressures on um, tax requisitions. So with that, um, I concludes my presentation and open to any questions or any further discussions on um, the use of these funds. Thank you. Uh, maybe I'll start, Lucy, in regards to, um, do you maybe provide me with a little bit more detail as to what the Goose Pit Trail is and what, what that's all about? Kevin's just going to pull it out and he's going to assist me as we go through these, um, uh, your questions and these projects. Thank you through the chair to the directors. So with respect to Goose Pit, there are a few activities that are currently within the uh, current five-year financial plan that have been identified uh, over the next few years. Uh, one being the uh, says wall log for Goose Pit. Uh, we have about $30,000 in this year and about $30,000 in next year. Uh, there's also some um, work in what's called Inner Bay uh, to the tune of about uh, $25,000. And then we have a number of kind of asset management related uh, projects or activities that are layered within the financial plan as well that tune about $60,000. So it's, it's a it's a bit of a mix of, of different initiatives that would be taking place uh, through, through the uh, park. We have it specifically targeted to what was planned for 2024. $90,000. Oh, if I could. Um, so in regards to the Lazo Road uh, project, uh, with the town of Comox putting in uh, a, a trail of some sort, uh, my understanding is that there is still a distance between Area B uh, and the town of Comox with regards to that trail that uh, there doesn't seem to be any funds or something available for that particular type project. I'm just wondering if that has been considered or not. Not one that we had on our list to be considered. Um, is that something you wish for us to go back and take a look at that? I, I would like to see something sure. uh, okay. considered there. Okay. Um, in regards to as well, um, looking at the criteria for for these funds, uh, there was um a couple of boxes in there with regards to affordable housing and with regards to uh works with indigenous peoples and i'm just wondering again again with regards to the wide shape friendship center uh and some of the concerns that have been put forward with regards to D dcc dollars if this is something that could be uh considered or or maybe there's funds that are directed to YJ for that amount and then you know, they can take care of the DCCs. So again, it's just a question uh, to put forward yes. for, for consideration. And I'm not sure if that's something that can be considered or, or, or can't because of whatever reason. And through the chair, um, one of the restrictions with the grant is that we can't, we can't um, um, award these grants to a third party. So that would that project is not something that's a piece of owned infrastructure for the CVRD, and this is where the limitation comes in being able to use these funds. Thanks, Lucy. And then the, the third item, just uh, again looking at various projects and, and yes. delegations that have come across us in the last little while, was in regards to search and rescue, yes. and whether or not you know trying to support these guys and and then moving forward if, if that's something that we can do with these funds or not through the chair that is a project that we did consider and as i um, mentioned as we went through our ranking criteria it wasn't one that floated um, to the top however um you know considering the conversation that we had through your 2023 financial planning process we did imagine that that may be a subject that came up today 
And if it is uh, something that you'd like to be like to consider, or if it's something that that um, that um, you'd like to put forward as a recommendation, that can occur. Lucy, um, given your previous comments, though, on us owning the infrastructure, it might vary or change the delivery of that project, right? Mm -hmm. so the, it might then have to be an asset owned by the regional district rather than it being money provided to the search and rescue club to do their own thing, right? Yes. Maybe what I'll suggest is if that's something that you want us to look into um, further, that we'll double check on that piece, that these funds can be used. Do you have any other comments on that particular one for you, sir? Kind of feels like it came. Uh, thank you through the chair to the directors. Yes, this is actually a, a question we reached out to the ministry directly just to get some clarification. So I did speak to uh, our program manager, Joshua Craig, uh, late last week, and it was specifically with respect to this uh, contributions to third parties, and, and they were very clear that uh, the only way we could possibly invest in affordable housing related projects as an example would be whether you know those those facilities were actually owned and are directly controlled <laughs> by the the local government uh, so it does actually put some some pretty you know st strict restrictions on those um there is the opportunity of, of helping to support First Nations infrastructure when it is a shared service or whether there is a, a service related relationship. So that would be something that would have to obviously be flushed out because we don't have a current situation with respect to that. So I think when looking at, you know, potentially helping to support a, a new um, um, search and rescue space, uh, I we would certainly run into to the, the same limitation or, or restriction with respect to uh, currently, you know, what's been proposed is that the uh, search and rescue uh, group would actually own that facility. So Russell is absolutely correct. It would change the nature of what that project may ultimately look like down the road. Thanks, Director Arbor. You had a question earlier? No? Director Green? Oh, yeah. You kidding? Um, looking at this list, um, I'm thinking we're going to have to strip away the nice to haves from the need to haves. And um, I imagine this is just a recommendation that's going to the board, right? And they get to look at this as well because it's it's obviously our money's being pooled together, correct? Okay. That's correct. But when I when I look at the list, I see things like Union Bay Fire Hall replacement. That's been long standing. No, but things like uh, trailways, viewing stands, not so much so. So um, is this coming to tomorrow's board meeting? Is that is that why the, 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 the heat is on here to try to get this through today or? Uh... Through the chair. So today, bringing it to um, EASE in order for you to be able to have discussions and um, consider recommendations, have, um, filter input into CBRD board. So tomorrow, the report is there um, on the board agenda just for information purposes. Uh, of course, they can have some discussion if they would like. So we don't anticipate endorsements happening at the earliest until we get to the May 9th CBRD board meeting. So there isn't any significant rush to get through this. We do have time to get through it. Um, you know, however, we are uh, looking at a number of projects here that are 2023, starting 2024. So being able to, especially when we're looking at things that potentially are funded with debt, being able to determine where these funds are, are going to go. Um, you know, like I'm saying, we don't have a real rush to get through them. Uh, however, you know, maybe in the, if, if by summertime we know where these dollars are going to go, it's just going to help us with our planning. And these projects. Well, knowing that, then I would I would consider uh, uh, deferring the actual recommendation on this to give us time for some sober second thought. I uh, I'm thinking it's it's too good an opportunity, um, especially uh, given the discussion at the last agenda last agenda item around Graham Lake. I mean, we have some some serious shortfalls that maybe uh, this this could better address than just some of the nice to have stuff. 
So, um, yeah, I think when it comes to the recommendation, I would like to give, uh, make a motion of referral. Thank you. So I don't see any more questions coming forward then. So do we want to vote on receipt or report? Cut direct harbor. Oh, sorry. Vote on receipt for the report. Yeah. Thank you. All in favor carried. And then in regards to the recommendation, do we directly agree to put forward something or we're wanting to put support something? I'd like to move to refer this to the next EASC meeting. And to give us some uh, sober second thought, or maybe in case of after after happy hours, some not so sober second thought. But I think it needs to we need to prioritize what is is truly critical, what is truly important. Thank you, Director. You're you're good with the recommendation the way it is. Yeah, uh, I'll second uh, the. Motion put forward by Director Grief to refer to the next electoral air service committee meeting. I don't see any harm in doing that. Okay. Vote. Vote on motion put forward by Director Grief. First, second. All in favor, carry. Thanks. Mr. Chair, when we bring this back to your next meeting, do you what is your focus? Is it water systems, fire halls? Can you give us any direction? And then we can bring back maybe some alternative projects that might fit the bill as to what the must-haves are as opposed to the nice-to-haves. Director Green. Yeah, you want my opinion? Okay, no. Seriously, I think fire halls are to go. I think water systems, sewer systems, conveyances. Um, you know, I'm sure that the roof of the aquatic center is probably important too, but um, because this is kind of a surprise present, um, I'm thinking it, it should really, we should turn our minds to it individually and uh, just take a really clear look at what's going to bring the maximum benefit to the majority of people on this. Thank you. And, and Director Harvey, Hardy and Arbor, if either of you have some input for us too and can help us bring it back. Yeah, I'll follow up in the next couple of days. Report for 11. Item 11. So motion to receive. Thank you. All in favor? Thank you, Chair and Directors. And Kevin Duvall will present the Community Works Fund report and recommendations and answer any of your questions. Thank you very much, Russell. Through the Chair to the Directors. So yes, on the heels of the uh, Growing Communities uh, Allocation Report, uh, staff are bringing forward for your consideration the Community Work Fund Status Report. Uh, for the end of March 31st, 2023. Uh, this report kind of encapsulates uh, our reconciliations for the Community Works Funds to the end of uh, December 2022. Uh, it will also, as I'll speak to uh, momentarily, incorporates all of the um, projects that were included and approved as part of the 23-27 financial plan. And then we'll also be bringing forward some, some recommendations for your consideration with um, potential allocations uh, for the remainder of these funds, given we're now officially into the final year of this 10-year Community Works Funds agreements, and certainly are anticipating uh, a reach out from UBCM shortly with respect to um, discussions with respect to a new multi-year contract uh, starting next year. So as the report indicates, uh, as of March 31st, $10.65 million of community works funds have been allocated to the uh, Comox Valley Regional District. Of that, $7.87 million has currently been uh, committed uh, you know, over the course of the last several years through our annual financial planning processes. So that does leave about $2.78 million left to commit uh, over the next little bit here. Um, we have identified um, within the staff report you know, some potential projects um, that could be considered uh, to, to allocate a significant portion of the rest of those dollars. 
And we have also indicated that as part of the recently completed 2023-27 financial planning process, about $2.45 million of projects uh, were uh, approved and incorporated into that financial plan and that we'll be beginning to move forward with over the next several years. The report also does provide you a kind of a, a sense of the uh, current balances that are remaining uh, within each of the allocated areas. So as we spoke uh, to in a previous report with respect to Graham Lake, uh, we do allocate these funds, you know, kind of on a, on a per region basis. So there is a separate allocation, of course, for Demon and Harvey Islands. And then we have an allocation for the Bain Sound portion of Electoral Area A, and then allocation separately for both areas B and C, respectively. Um, we have also put forward a recommendation with respect to the board's uh, previous allocation of $100,000 uh, towards the Beulah Creek housing project on, on Hornby Island. Uh, as this uh, committee will, will re recall, uh, it was determined that from a community works fund perspective, that project is ineligible to receive community works funds because uh, affordable housing is actually deemed an ineligible activity for this purpose. However, we, you know, as part of the 23 financial plan, have included contributions um, from the respective Denman and Hornby Island Economic Development Services to the tune of $100,000 each. Uh, to help support uh, two projects in the islands, one being Beulah Creek and the other one being the Demon Green project on Demon Island. So what we've included is, is some potential projects that, uh, as our CFO alluded to, do dovetail with some of the recommendations that were put forward as part of the uh, Growing Communities grant allocations. Uh, again, fire services are definitely a, a, a theme again here um, because we are really striving to, when assessing kind of the 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 eligibility and viability of these projects, really looking at what that longer term uh, tax impact would be. Is there an opportunity to limit uh, draws from maybe some reserves that are, are, are looking at some capacity challenges and certainly also looking at ways to reduce, if not you know, possibly eliminate any debt that may be required to fund any one of these projects? So as the report indicates, you know, we've we've looked at a few projects um, and, and brought forward some some suggestions for your consideration, uh, one being the Union Bay Fire Hall project. Uh, as it was just previously noted, this has been a long standing item for that particular community. That hall is well past its uh, life cycle date and certainly something that that could benefit from a contribution of community works funds. Uh, we've also proposed some some smaller allocations to a couple of our smaller sewer systems. Uh, again, partly because they are smaller uh, inherited services uh, that the regional district now manages. Uh, the reserve capacities there are fairly small, and these would certainly eliminate any need to, to draw reserves out of those services and keep those funds in place for any uh, future anticipated uh, projects that may arise or certainly any unforeseen or unplanned expenditures that, that could also arise. Um, we've also looked at uh, possibly uh, another allocation for the uh, sewer service, the South Extension. Um, you know, certainly an area where uh, there's going to be some significant resources required to enable that project to continue to move forward in a timely manner. So, so an area where staff certainly, um, you know, recommend that some some dollars could be allocated. So really, that's all I have to bring forward with respect to this regular report today. But certainly, you know, welcome any questions you may have. So if I, if I could, so the, the previous um, recommendations in regards to over a million dollars going to the Union Bay Fire Hall, is, is that the same amount here? Like, are we looking at a contribution of over two point something million going to the Union Bay? Or is that if, if we focus dollars here, then we don't have to move these dollars here or these dollars are kept freed up? Uh, to the chair, so certainly this would be additional dollars to what um, the CFO alluded to in the Growing Communities Report, given that that project is about a $3 million project within the financial plan currently. So with this amount you know, being contributed, potentially a further amount being contributed through the, the Growing Communities Fund, that would certainly limit uh, the, the debt that would uh, ultimately be required to, to ensure that that project does go forward. And at this point, that project... Uh, we are anticipating some some kind of design and pre-engineer work to start this year, but certainly hoping that the project can start in earnest uh, in 2024. 
If I could just add a, um, just a thought to that, as Kevin has alluded, that particular fire hall currently is $3 million funded all with debt. And um, with Union Bay Fire Services, along with the other two, it is an area where we see that, that um, they could use some financial help. There's a lot of pressures there. And Mr. Chair, if I could just add to it, it would be nice to have not necessarily today or more at the next meeting, but sooner than later, some resolution on those factors that may influence overall cost to Union Bay. When we go to the community with respect to the conveyance project and the implications of that, it would be nice to know whether or not the community will receive relief on some of these other um, dramatic and potential increases to, to their taxation. Director. Thanks, and for your benefit, Chair, uh, I know you're not, this is your first go around with this one with the community works, but uh, unlike the prior one, where third party are not eligible with community works, these funds are eligible to third party contributions. So as you consider your REB contribution, when you talked about certain projects other than housing, <laughs> uh, these funds can be uh, allocated in partnership with other organizations, just for your knowledge. Thank you. So, guess phone number you see to report. Barbara, agree. All in favor? Carried. Director Ruggie. Uh, once again, I think we need some careful consideration. I'm looking down this list and I see some stuff that uh, is absolutely uh, essential, core local government services. And I also see some stuff that, uh, you know, what do I, what do I, I got quite a commitment here out of my, my funds, uh, 3,658,000 some odd dollars. Uh, so, you know, it's uh, some of it again, I see that is, uh, Things that uh, would benefit Area C and some stuff maybe is not not as critical. So I don't know how the committee feels, but uh, I think, again, it's something to chew on. I don't, don't want to rush to uh, to make decisions here. I'd like to take a look at this. If it's appropriate for one, one last comment. I, I totally can understand needing um, a bit more time to digest and also that both of these reports are tied together. And the only thing that I wanted to add is that it's, um, they're both grant funding. And what we've done in our analysis is um, uh, just put a lot of thought uh, into, so where can we best leverage these funds in order to help your services? So as I said, you're trying to, and high on the list is um, financial pressures out there with our services. Um, um, and also one high recommendation from myself is when we do have grant um, dollars available to try to use those first before we start to contemplate bringing in debt. Because of course, when you, when you fund with debt, then you also have additional costs that are accumulating along the way for the taxpayer because we are funding with debt. So I just leave that with you. And absolutely, these dollars can be layered um, anywhere you wish in your financial plan. And, um, uh, you know, currently the projects that, that are um, on our list that we have been contemplating are existing in your 2023 uh, financial plan as well. So for all intents and purposes, the projects are going to go forward. It's a matter of, um, of how they will be funded and which services will in the end benefit from having additional grant funds allocated to them. And if I could as well, uh, through the chair to the director. So in table one on page four of the staff report, that's really what we're seeking direction from um, the committee to, to allocate. So just to Director Greaves specifically, um, currently Area C has about $792,000 on unallocated funds as part of what we would be recommending today. Uh, we'd be recommending about a $500,000 contribution additionally to the South ex Sewer Extension South project, which would still leave you about 281000 
what I would also ask is, you know, if if the committee was was wanting to defer um, the remaining allocation requests, if at the very least the uh, decommission of the Beulah Creek contribution could be made today, just so that we can make sure that that money does go back into the uh, community works funds pool. Cover? Yeah, thanks. I, I agree with deferral uh, for most of the probably all the directors here. You know, we've had 12 hours to consider uh, seven and a half million dollars worth of attribution. I think the deferral option by the director makes total sense. Thank you. Let me see this. I'll, I'll, um, I'll still move that um, 100,000 in the uh, the first part of the 100,000 defined portion of electoral area Edem and Horby Island be decommitted from the Community Works Fund program, but not the end further. Seconder? All in favor? Mm -hmm. Director Armour, or sorry, Director B. No, so we need to still need to move referral on this, right? So yeah. refer it back to the, the next EASC meeting. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry. So we're, we're on recommendations. We've already voted on receipt of report. Just was just double checking. We voted on receipt of report already, right? So we're just moving on recommendations. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So now we're working on referring uh, the recommendation to the next East meeting. Second part. Second. All in favor, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy and Kevin. Oh, here you go. Speed like press pass. Second. Thank you very much, Chair and Director. So Mike Zabarski is here to provide a brief verbal update with respect to this matter and answer any of your questions. Thanks, Russell. Through the through the chair to the committee, um, as you may recall, in January, we brought a report forward about the uh, light trespass issue caused by the BC Hydro's LED light replacement program. Um, the motion from that meeting was to send a letter to the province requesting them to kind of take ownership of resolving these issues and to consider the um, shields. Uh, we have received the response from BC Hydro. You've got that in the agenda here. And unfortunately, they are uh, sticking to their guns and reiterating that lighting design is the responsibility of us, the customer, and that they do not offer shields on their lights. Uh, they've suggested using a third party engineer or consultant to, to undertake the designs for any changes and that we then send those to BC Hydro uh, and they will consider making modifications that are included in the, in the list on page two here. Um, so at this point, we're kind of back to having a number of light trespass concerns and no viable solutions. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Victor. Thanks. Um, having learned that, you know, even though we kind of followed Moti's advice that we did have an opportunity on the design of these lights, I can see BC Hydro's argument as being valid, um, though I don't like it. I think that what I would like staff or maybe the committee to consider is that over the next number of months, staff come back with a summary of where we see um, complaints and where we see how we, whether we could adjust our rates to those specific light services in order to pay for the changes of those specific lights or improvements to those specific lights via the service. I realize there could be a concern that this could lead to a wave. <laughs> of people wanting further, but I think that there's some evidence in, in some of the correspondence that we've received that there truly are places where 
it's smack into people's bedroom and it's an ongoing concern and we have, it's just not getting resolved. So it'd be interesting to see an analysis from staff. If we wanted to pay it out of the services, what does that look like? What could a small program look like? Not changing all the lights, but making some adjustments. Otherwise, I don't see, I think I agree with staff. Otherwise, I don't see any viable path. But I think for those that are really affected, we should try to uh, to address the concern. Great. Well, I guess the silver lining here is the fact that uh, lights get dimmer with time. But um, did I read that, uh, that in some cases uh, they have let a third party do some some customization of the lights? Or did I? If some of the jurisdictions they actually allow some lensing or something. Is nothing like that? The. Um... The only cases of streetlights having a shield that, yeah. we've, that we've seen have been within municipalities on municipally owned streetlights, so not the BC Hydro lights. So would they be adverse to doing it if we paid for it? Yes. They've specifically told us they will not put up shields on BC Hydro owned lights, even if we pay for it. Yeah. Well, that seems unreasonable. Maybe they... Well, who's O'Reilly's boss? Thank you. The question I had is in regards to can we change um, the lumens on the on the light? Yeah. Do we yeah, have so that ability to do that? Yep. Uh, BC Hydro have offered to change the lumens. Uh, so the wattage from a 75 watt, which is currently what's in place, down to a 39 watt. Uh, we can also change the color range. Uh, we can adjust the, the tilt and pitch uh, of the existing light, and we can look at different support arms so longer arms different angles of arms uh, but to kind of determine what those specific design changes should be we would need to hire an engineer with specific expertise in roadway lighting um would we also maybe want to do community consultation because maybe some people like the really bright light out in front of their house and other people would rather not have a bright light so that way we don't go and turn around and change the whole light system and then you got 1,500 people coming back saying, what the hell? It's dark in our neighborhood. We don't want to do that. So i just wonder, and, and with regards to those abilities to change those lights or the colors, et cetera, is that cost BC Hydro or the cost of the CBRD? That would be a cost of CBRD. Okay. So, <laughs> so then my follow-up question, if I could, is based upon some of the grant dollars that have been brought forward over the last week or so, whether it's community work funds or the growing community uh, grant funds, is there a means of using some of those funds to cover some of the costs of that, that activity? Thanks. I mean, that would be something to look into, I think. The uh, Mr. Control. Chair, Sorry. maybe in the essence of time, I'm hearing that you want us to come back to you with ideas. Let us explore where we see the uh, potential problem areas, come back with maybe a policy that would guide you in determining where you do contribute or not, and we can look at alternative funding options as well. So moved. Sounds great. Thanks, Russell. First one, please. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. So again, uh, we're now moving into receipt, uh, vote on receipt of the report. Yeah. Okay. All in favor carried. Then we have recommendation. The recommendation is for stuff to. All in favor. Perfect. Thanks. 11. Uh, 56, so we're going in camera. Yep. <laughs> 